everybody. Welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm, week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and proud owner of the only remaining successful business in Brockton Bay, Matt's Glass Repair Shop. As always, I am joined today by my co-host, Scott Daly, who's uh, calling in this week from the emergency room. Scott, did we forget to take our cell phone out of our pocket? Uh, Matt, I specifically said not to bring this up beforehand. What? Yeah, um, if you could do the, the iodine instead of the hydrogen peroxide, I, I read somewhere that was, that was better. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, sorry. Um, yes, this, Matt, is a podcast where you, an officially licensed worm expert, guide me, a first-time reader, through the flooded, glass-strewn wasteland formerly referred to as Brockton Bay, as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week... We're battling back the infection of Arc 12 in Arc 12 Plague. Matt, it feels like we've set everything up now and are using the, the whole rising action thing for kind of book two of Worm. That's what this arc feels like to me. Did you did you like it? Oh, yes. This is a this is a great arc. I, I think I think rising action is a, is a fair way of putting it. We're we're uh, we're putting all the <laughs> chess pieces on the chessboard. <laughs> uh, no references for the, for the game. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've introduced the Slaughterhouse Nine and now we are, we're getting the pieces moving and and quite a lot of pieces do move in this arc. We have a lot of, uh, injury and death and horror and it's just fantastic. Yeah. And there's a lot of, uh, internal struggling for, for our girl again. Um, she's once again, kind of at a crossroads, um, and trying to, to, to decide like the, the, the Slaughterhouse Nine represent this, uh, increased stakes and, the the things that she thought were her moral fiber are being tested and uh it's very interesting i like it a lot yeah it, it's very interesting to add this kind of contrast at this point where we've we've we were kind of you know getting being being a little hard on taylor and 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 uh and then suddenly something comes along that in contrast to taylor makes taylor seem like uh, uh, silver age comic book superhero yeah i mean you're absolutely right this is by far the most uh, just flat out superhero esque Taylor has been, and I think in the entire book, um, yeah. in this in this arc. So I, I, we're going to talk a lot about that. We're going to talk about how that kind of uh, is butting up against her also um, <laughs> like vast increasing supervillain esque control yeah. of an area. So like I think I think these two things are are definitely bumping up against each other in this episode as her moral questions about what is the right thing to do. What is the wrong thing to do when these situations are bumping up against each other? So it's it's really it's really great. I loved it a lot. Um, really fascinating stuff. Very interesting interludes as well. So uh, arc twelve. Yeah. All right, Scott. Uh, first, I guess we have an announcement um, before we move on. Uh, it, we just wanted to apologize for the lateness of this episode. Um, me and Scott were supposed to meet uh, with our, our other friend. Um, who was on the Wonder Woman podcast, Michael, uh, at a secluded mountain location uh, <laughs> for for a weekend retreat for working on a, an audio drama project that we're that we're creating together. Uh, Scott's plane was delayed by essentially forty eight hours. Yep. So that didn't end up happening the way it was planned. Um, but but we were able to work on it with Scott remote. Yeah, uh, we were yeah. I, on Skype for. It's probably 12 hours over the course of those three days. Um, I am, it, it's very early in this project, so we are not like ready to talk about it in any kind of detail at all, but uh, I'm very excited about it. And yeah, I, think, I, mean, I think you guys are going to really like it. Yeah, we, we made a lot of progress. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to have some kind of pilot out as soon as we possibly can. I'm not saying that's going to be soon, but uh, look, look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're sorry that we were late this week. Um, we had that, and then you got a little sick. You sound you sound much better, Matt. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm still a bit sick, but better than I was uh, during the Wonder Woman podcast. <laughs> yeah, you you were noticeably noticeably bad sounding during mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll be back on schedule next week. Next Wednesday will be our next episode. So this is just a little bit of an interruption. We apologize, but uh, but we're we're committed. We're still going to do this. Yes. Speaking of which. Speaking of which, we can move on into discussions and questions from the previous episode. Um, uh, first, a comment from Wildbo, uh, as usual. Wildbo, uh, in the in the thread this week, talks about his love of horror movies, 
and let Scott dive deep into his love for both the Babadook and It Follows. Um, yeah, I'm just going to move on because if I pause for a second here and let Scott start talking about these movies, we're never going to get to Worm. But uh, Scott Wildbow did have a question for us this week. Uh, he says, it, was, it wasn't it was touched on much with the focus on Panacea's state and where she was at. What do you think about Glory Girl's reaction? Yeah, I like this a lot um, because uh, because of how it relates to Babadook. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, like I think that's that's definitely true. We were so caught up in what was going on in Amy's head at this time that we didn't really think, what is Glory Girl? <laughs> like, how is she reacting to this? Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of tendency to, like, say she overreacted and was kind of mean. But I think her reaction was very fair. I mean, I think she's she doesn't know what's going on. She's already mad at Amy because Amy refuses to explain why, like any, anything that's going on with her, like she completely like cuts out her sister and best friend. Um, and then suddenly dumps this stuff on her. And then it's like this, it's like this, like this intrusion in yourself. That's like beyond anything that any normal person could do. So like, I, I would be completely disgusted by that as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was, I mean, she's completely in the right. I mean, maybe if she would, she probably would calm down a little bit afterwards and then maybe try to see if she can make it right with her sister. But I think in the moment, like the way she reacted was definitely fair. Yeah. I think there's, there's, it stems from a lack of kind of understanding and communication because since, since we're in Amy's head, we know that she has, she's in a sense, like not fully in control of her power, or at least that's how she perceives it. Cause she's sort of, as we pointed out last week, kind of like semi consciously, semi unconsciously does what she does. Um, and, and I don't think glory girl can really relate to that. Like in, from her point of view, she figures that Amy just did that on purpose. Right. And it's a little bit more complex than that. And another thing that was mentioned in the thread, and I apologize for not pulling the, the name of the, of the user. I'll, uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to go give some special, special upvotes though. Um, that, uh, glory girl has her her kind of passive mood altering field that has been mentioned a couple times where she can basically make people feel intimidated or various things um or or, or like kind of in awe of her is one of the things like she can basically make people around her feel in awe of her and this is not specifically mentioned in context of amy being attracted to her but it is something i think that is uh present what do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I like that. I, I would like I'm hesitant to want to blame everything, every character interaction, every character trait on just powers, mm-hmm. um, because I think that's kind of less narratively interesting than uh, personality. But if you use the powers as a metaphor, then you can use the powers as a reflection of those in- character traits. So um, I, I think you can absolutely say that Glory Girl herself without her powers like emits a sort of aura to everyone around her like like just in her personality just how she is so um yeah i think that that ties into things absolutely i think it ties into how the emotions are a little heightened um and and how maybe she acted in a way that she normally wouldn't uh, or amy wouldn't like you take her already fragile emotional state you combine the fact that she's in love with her sister with the fact that her sister is constantly emanating an aura of love and friendship and awe. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's very, very possible. Um, I don't know if there's anything textually to that, but it's something you keep in the back of your mind for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I I like, I like pointing out that, that even if you, you can choose to view it as a metaphor or you can choose to view it as kind of the literal interpretation and it works either way. Yeah. I think that's like we've said, you know, a few times and now I think the metaphors in worm are great because they work both as a metaphor and just as a literal, this is a result of power X. Yeah. Um, And I I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, So we, we also got tons of feedback regarding our guesses for Cherish's um, nicknames for the recruits. Um, And it sounds like the correct answers uh, have 
Futurity as the Crusader and Hookwolf as the Warlord, and Alec is not even being counted, which makes sense if if I closely read that actual passage that she specifically says that she doesn't have a nickname for Alec. So that was yeah that was I, our, our oversight, I guess. I read that, and I guess in my head I interpreted it as I don't even have to say who he is because I know, um, mm-hmm. which was a, probably a weird interpretation now that I think of it. But I guess I just counted eight and just lumped him into it because I... I I I didn't ever think of purity as one of them, and I don't know mm-hmm. if, I, like, are the the tests going to be against purity now? I don't know. I, I I think in the interlude they don't seem to consider her a candidate when they're talking about how everything's going to play out with the candidate. So I don't know. Um, yeah, that is a little confusing because because and and also since everything's happening at the same time, did 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 he go get Oni Lee previously and then have time to tell? Cherish that only Lee, only Lee was dead, and then pick another person in that short time frame. I, I'm not sure on the timeline. Actually, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but well, anyways. Um, the next comment user Kifru um, is basically asking. I'm gonna summarize. Um, um, do you think that Worm is you know better and more internally consistent um, because it is a singular author writing a web serial versus a comic book medium? with lots of, you know, reboots, lots of authors, lots of different ideas over time. Um, And would Worm be able to maintain what it is if it were a comic book? Um, Um, (laughs) Short answer, uh, yes, that's why it's better able to be internally consistent. And no, I don't think it would be the same thing it is as a a comic book. Um, I think that's one of my main issues with comic books. And and it's understandable, like you get different writers on the character. They're going to have different interpretations. They're going to want to do different things with them, but it's just like your image of what, who a character is may or may not be consistent with what it, what the character is currently doing. Like I have this image of who Superman is and there are actually very few comic books (laughs) that match my image of Superman, but they're, they're out there. They exist. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think comic books as they are allow you to kind of pick and choose the the parts of the traits of the character and the traits of the powers and the traits of the genre that you like um but it doesn't it doesn't allow that consistency i don't think you can tell a, a as good of a through line story that is one individual thing with a comic book um yeah. and i think the fact that this is all wild bow and it's all his creations and it's his understanding of how they work and his setting of the rules and and not only that just it's not even the setting and the rules and stuff it's what he wants to do with the story how he wants to take these things and what story he wants to tell with those elements um that someone else coming in would want to do a completely different thing with that and it and it could it, it could exist in the same world and be a completely different kind of story yeah i think i think i've probably said this a number of times in other podcasts of ours that like most most really great things seem to arise from like one really strong creative vision and that may like that in the case of a movie that maybe the visionary is the screenwriter or it may be the visionary is the director or it, you know it could be any number of, of things but um and sometimes you do get a rare a rare occasion where you've got multiple visionaries working on the same thing and you end up with a transcendent product but i don't think that's what comic books is um and I think uh, also, I think I mentioned this in the thread that George R. R. Martin has this like curated universe called Wild Cards, which is like grimdark superhero novels that lots of other authors contribute to. Um, he's only written he's written a relatively small you know fraction of the of the Wild Card stories. Mm-hmm. And my understanding is that they're bad, um, and that doesn't surprise me because just because George R. R. Martin is involved doesn't mean it's going to be saved. Yeah, yeah, I, and I don't want to like. I don't want to say that just like this could never be like, because we got another question about that. Cause we talk about adaptation and, and because I'm a, I'm a cinema guy. Like I talk about, Oh, I can imagine how this would look in a TV show or a movie. So we got another question that was basically like, I think it was dark glass 57 who basically said, do like so much would be lost in adapting worm to another format. Um, and I agree I, I definitely think I agree, but like with any adaptation, you can distill down to the core of what the thing is and find a way to translate that core into another medium. 
Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't prescribe to the thing, to the idea that like there are things that are just unadaptable. Um, it will have to change and a good adaptation recognizes the limitations of the, the certain, um, of the source material and the limitations of the adapted material and, um, can get, can get there with that material, um, with the same level of impact. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many things that would change and, and I think I probably always think the book is better, which I do with most adaptations. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think it's, it's just important to keep in mind that an adaptation is always going to be like, you know, fundamentally it's something inspired by the original thing, but if you just wanted a movie version of the original thing, then you should just read the original thing and not not concern yourself with getting a movie of it because it's never going to be that exactly. Yeah, but I, and I think, but that's not to say I don't think that a worm television show would not be great because I think mm-hmm. it would. I think it would have to change. I think it would be very different. Um, it would be stylistically different. How you you would have to tackle a whole set of problems that not even I probably could <laughs> think right now of, of how to deal with. I don't know how you you deal with Taylor's internal monologue um, in an interesting cinematic way um, that doesn't completely destroy what you're trying to do with the character. But um, I think, I think it could be done. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. Yeah. Just has to make some good decisions. All right, Scott. Well, that's the comments for this week. Uh, I think we're ready to move into the beat by beat discussion for arc 12. Let's do it. Okay. So we start out with hang, uh, Taylor hanging out with her minions in her domesticized part of her lair, and she's using her bugs to creepily assemble alarm boxes out of uh, origami paper and bugs. Yes, I really like this. Um, I think this is very, like, once again, we're seeing how clever she is. Um, so basically, someone's in trouble, they squish their paper box, and she's there. And she made it seem like she'd be there, like, almost instantly. Like, her bugs would be there, like, within seconds. Um, which mm-hmm. is kind of crazy, and but I kind of believe it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she's really, really good with her power now. Um, but the other thing I want to talk about in this whole conversation as she's doing this um, is, you know, we talk about the first chapter of any arc as the setup of the arc, and we talk about this over and over again, and we see it again here, um, because Taylor has this conversation with... Um, uh, it's Charlotte, right? Yeah, Charlotte. She has this conversation so. with Charlotte where, where Taylor is basically, through the concept of her bugs being creepy, is establishing her whole theory on, on metaphor and flexible metaphor. Or, sorry, not morality and flexible morality. Um, and I think this is really cool because, like I said at the beginning, like this entire arc is going to be challenging that idea she has. But she comes off so confident here. Like she, I, this, I like this quote a lot, like, I don't believe in shouldn't like there's some universal rules about the way things should be the way people should act. And she says, there's always going to be consequences, but I don't think there's, I do think there's always going to be extenuating circumstances where a lot of things we normally assume are wrong become excusable. Um, so that's like her whole ethos. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like that Charlotte like immediately calls her out on it. <laughs> like, yeah. like she like almost without missing a beat is like, like rape. Are you just going to tell me that's okay? And she's yeah. like, no, no. Like, so she comes off as she's got, like, she's got her morality figured out and she knows exactly where she stands, but we can already see like chinks in that just through her minion. And we're going to continue to get chinks in that as we go through the, the arc. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, it's, she's, she's definitely shifted a lot over time and she's about to get a, a kick in the teeth when it comes to her formulation of right and wrong. Yep. So the minions uh, are going to go canvas the neighborhood and check on everyone, see who's see who's where. Um, they're, they're supposed to see what types of people are there and what they need. And she also wants them to scope out the possibility of hiring more minions. <clears throat> and they briefly discuss payment. And she says she'll be paying them two hundred and fifty dollars a day. And then she hands them some creepy silk masks to use. Yeah. So this is like sixty five grand a year each, um, <laughs> which is a, a lot of money. I think she said she she has a, like she still has a lot of money, but I think she said it was like three hundred fifty thousand or something, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not like an infinite supply of money. And I think this is definitely supposed to show us that Taylor is not thinking long term with all this stuff. She's very short term. She's not thinking things out. She's doing what she needs to do in the immediate short term. And and Brian will call her out on that here yeah. at the end of this chapter, right? Um, and I think that's it is, this is the setup for that. Yeah, specifically how she's not really thinking about Coyle's resources the way she should be for her plan to work. Yeah. 
Yeah, so she she thinks to herself about how these two women have both seen her bleed and how Charlotte knows her as as the weak tailor. And she thinks to herself, I wouldn't feel secure in my reputation until I divorced Skitter from that image of a weaker abused tailor. Yeah, and this is another trend that we're going to see throughout this episode is her like beating herself up over this idea of people seeing her as weak um, and trying to divorce Taylor from Skitter, even though we've seen again and again, like the line between those two people blurring, but she's like pushing against it. And she's like, to these people, I'm Skitter. You can't see me weak. You can't see me hurt. You can't see me not confident. Like I have to be this person. Um, and she uses this theatrics. She uses intimidation over and over again. And I think we're going to see later in the story that, um, that is not the way she actually ends up winning people over to her. Um, it's, a, it's quite the opposite in fact. Um, and it, it shows once again that how like both conscious of, but completely unaware of people's perception she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, she's so eager to, to reject everything Taylor from Skitter that she comes close to rejecting even the good parts of, of Taylor. And it's, it's really is that little bit of superhero showing through that, that actually ends up kind of, uh, redeeming this skitter character yep so uh now she's liaising through cranston because coil is too busy dealing with all the other people's uh um problems all the time uh, and she's ordered some darwin's bark biters which and i was not aware how freaking strong these things were until i uh read this and then wikipedia it um it's yeah. incredible <laughs> like these yeah. they like they like tie their webs across giant rivers um because they're so strong they can be that long right yeah i see you you've you've created some notes for us here that, that they're <laughs> over 10 times tougher than kevlar and so if she's making like a costume out of it you've got a pretty tough costume there um yeah, yeah. i didn't i didn't i don't think i realized they were that strong either yeah. although i did i did know that spider silk in general is comparable to kevlar yeah, um, I, I might have mentioned this before, but I really think she just needs to fly to Australia and just like yeah. <laughs> collect a bunch of bugs. Yeah, she'd be unstoppable. She could just be warlord of Australia. <laughs> so uh, Charlotte calls her to inform her about a rodent problem in one of the buildings in her territory. Uh, so she she uses her bugs while she's still in her lair. She's like walking there and she's using her bugs to find all the rodents and then viciously wipe them out uh, as she makes her way there on foot. Yeah, this is terrifying <laughs> in a kind of really awesome way. Um, this is one of those moments that I think would work beautifully in a, a visual adaptation again. Like yeah. the, the image of just like these rat corpses floating on top of a swarm of bugs as they walk them out of the, the house um, is really yeah. great. It's really great. Yeah, especially that these people who she's doing it for don't really know that she's going to do it. So right. They're standing yeah. there and then yeah. suddenly this ocean of bugs and dead rats appears. Yeah. Gru texts her while she's on her way there and she agrees to meet him at the rat location. And uh, once once Skitter uh, has, has dealt with the rats, she has to deal with ungrateful serfs again. Uh, the dad of the family challenges her in order to assert himself and feel like a man. And she reaches out to the kid of the family in order to work around the man. Uh, and the, the mom ends up thanking her for what she's done, but she still doesn't really seem to... Uh, Taylor doesn't seem to appreciate being thanked even in this case, um, she she thinks, I felt bad for feeling the way I did, but I thought her gratitude was a little muted for what I was giving her. Yeah, and I think this ties into what we were just talking about with these theatrics and this inhumanity that she wants to project to uh, kind of will people into following her. And, like, you're right, she didn't tell them she was doing this. She just showed up. Um, and she's ordering them around. She's making herself look like the scary bug lady. And then she's like mad when people aren't like, like bowing at her feet. Um, it's because you're scaring them. Like you're, you're scaring these people. They have no idea what to make of you. They don't know who you are. They don't know what you are. You're scaring them. Yeah. And you right. might be helping them and that's good. I'm not saying that's not good, but like, you can't just expect people to just like come over to your side immediately just cause <laughs> You invaded their house with bugs and killed all their rats. Right. Yeah. So then uh, Gru does show up and they chat about her leadership style and her priorities a bit. Uh, he tries to explain what motivates a man to behave the way the, the dad did um, and, and kind of how it's like a macho self-protective thing. 
Uh, and Guru makes a point about how guys and girls, the, the guys and girls in the Undersiders are handling their territories with characteristic gender-based differences. At least this is his his notion. And he's pointing out that the women are being nurturing and uh, relative to what the guys are doing. Uh, and he thinks that they should be more aggressive. Just a little sexist. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I like her counter to this because she basically is like, no, it's because our powers are different. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, which actually makes sense. Like, he has a very aggressive power set. Like, she doesn't, like, especially Lisa. Like, Lisa can't be aggressive, really. Like, so I don't know. Um, Brian. Yeah. It, it's funny because cause she, she's defensive and she's like, she's like, hey, look, I, I, I secured my territory like in a day. I secured it way faster than any of you guys did. And and I am being aggressive and, and grew counters. He's like, you're not really being aggressive and going after the thing that Coil wants you to go after. You've yes, you've secured your territory against rival gangs, but like he he kind of wants you to be a, a despotic gang leader here and you're just kind of yeah. hanging out. So Yeah, and I think I think that that the the cool thing about this is that Brian kind of is annoying here. And I think he's like, right. Like, I think he's completely right, but we're in Taylor's head. Right. So it feels like nagging. It feels like patronizing. And that's, so that's how we interpret it. Cause I was like, I was like, Brian, shut up. Like you're being annoying. Yeah. But I think, I think he's, he is overly cautious sometimes and he thinks way too hard about things, but like he seems right more than he's wrong. So um, I, I think I, this is a, this is a testament to Wildwood's writing that again we're so far in Taylor's point of view that uh, characters annoy me when they probably wouldn't if I was looking at it from a different perspective. Yeah, that's true, and we're going to see Taylor do some things in this chapter in this uh, arc that are objectively highly reckless. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and uh, and he, and he's going to be on the right side there, but it's not going to feel like it then either, though. Um, yeah. So, um, Gru, uh, relates to her that the set, that the Slaughterhouse Nine visited Regent and probably others, and that Hookwolf is calling another big meeting of the local capes. And Taylor thinks they should go, but Brian is once again characteristically more reluctant to do so. But he, but then he actually doesn't really have to be convinced. He's like, Yeah, I think we should go. I just feel kind of wary about it. When does Brian not feel wary about something? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, but this is this ties into that again. He's coming. He comes off kind of annoying here, um, especially from the point of a reader where you're like a meeting of everyone. I want to go. I want to see right. that. So you're kind of like, OK, let's do it. Let's do it. And then you have Brian in the back. Like, well, I don't know. And you're just like, no, shut up. Let's go. Let's yeah. go. Um, I like that. I think that the, the pace and tone of that that conversation really sets that up. And I think you're supposed to kind of feel annoyed by him. Yeah, it is interesting interesting to see kind of the contrast of taylor's character here because she's like yes yes let's move let's move move things along let's uh let's let's be aggressive here and and he's like cautious as always so yeah yeah. all right so we begin 12.2 the undersiders are riding a pair of boats out to the meeting place uh in the middle of the inbringer made lake um she's she's riding in the boat and she's thinking about flying almost as if it's like her uh her destiny to fly. I don't know, Scott. Scott speculation. <laughs> Trademark. She also notes that Rachel has a new puppy, which she's bringing with her to the meeting, and how having a puppy is not the most intimidating thing in the world. But it's um, a little puppy. Yeah, it's meant to make people not aggressive toward the undersiders. It's clearly a psychological maneuver. She's so smart, that Rachel. Yeah. So she finds herself in an interesting, almost calm emotional state, which is remarkably different from her usual state of constant anxiety and stress. Yeah, I I really like this a lot, too, Um, because I like it says here that like her anxiety, her stress is tied to this active nature of herself, how she's always having to make choices. She's always having to make decisions Um, and she's constantly like worrying about like this choice versus that choice. Is this the right choice? Um, and now she, in this one little fleeting moment, doesn't have to worry about any of that. It's out of her hands. And yeah. that's, that's a very realistic, uh, emotion too. Um, I, I remember like when I was in school, anytime you have like a big test or a big project, you're so freaking nervous and stressed out about it. Then you turn it in and there's that brief moment where you're just like, okay, it's done. It's out of my hands. Like, 
and you're just yeah. calm in that moment. So it's a very relatable kind of emotion. Yeah, that, that's interesting. This this kind of reminds me of how I've I've heard people say that they they appreciate the interludes in Worm because Taylor's head is such an intense place to be that sometimes it's nice to have a, a break and be in somebody else's head who's who's less uh, uh, keep keep using this word but less aggressive with uh, with reality. Yeah, yeah, just really calm. Uh, you know, normal people like Jack yeah. and Alec. Yeah. Just, you know, just yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, Alec is actually a very calm person, so. Yeah, I mean, in a in so is Jack. psychotic kind of way. Yeah, it's soothing. It's soothing yeah. to be in yeah. Alec's oh, head. Yeah. Oh, don't you yeah. agree? Yeah. And it's soothing for Alec to be in your head. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I like that you pulled out this beat where Tattletail, it says, Tattletail didn't slow our boat like Gru had his, and instead steered the boat in a wide U to ride up onto the corner of the roof. Regent and I hopped out to grab the front of the boat to help pull it up. When Gru rode his boat aground as well, a a little more carefully, we helped him too. Yeah, I think this is just a really great way of showing how how you can characterize people within beats in the story, and you don't have to do it through just exposition. Like, this is just a small, tiny little moment, but it's like, look, Tattletail is just going to drive her boat up. (laughs) And then (laughs) Gru is like, oh, oh, careful. Oh, don't want to hit the, don't don't want to bump into the abandoned building that's underwater. Yeah. Yeah. Don't want to seem reckless in front of these super villains. Yeah. <laughs> so they're signaled. Yeah. So, so anyway, they, they, they come in on the boats. Um, it's, it's what used to be a tall building in the middle of that lake and Hoke Wolf's chosen are there still all cut up from, uh, from the glass, although they've healed, I guess, due to the, due to Othala's power. Uh, notably, it seems that all of the capes that we know the names of are still alive, which is, uh, actually, I think surprised me. Yeah, it surprised me too. I thought for sure Cricket was dead. Yeah, got her throat sliced open. But I guess that that healer is pretty powerful. I guess. Yeah, it, it seemed from the last arc like like Othala's power was pretty slow. But I don't know. I guess I don't have a good read on what that power is. At least not yet. Uh, yeah. So Faultline's crew are more covered up with their costumes than usual, uh, which we can infer is due to having all been horribly burned. Yeah, I like this a lot because it's like you see um, you see the Undersiders and then you see the Travelers, both the groups that work for Coil, and they're kind of fine. And like everyone else has already suffered. Um, yeah. And I think that immediately kind of draws the line between the two groups um, in what's going to be a, a widening conflict. Yeah. So then the merchants arrive on their goblin built stealth boat. Uh, I like the description of Squealer, the Tinker, as the opposite of Arms Master. Yeah, and as if Mad Max wasn't already in my head, like this giant, loud, annoying boat, like, <laughs> and now yeah. permanently makes me think of of the Doof Warrior and his giant <laughs> uh, speaker car um, from Fairy totally. Road. So yes, it's it's absolutely. just in my head, and it's perfect. Um, but these yeah. guys, these guys suck so much. Like, it'd be a shame yeah. if something were to happen to them in five chapters, yeah. eight, eight no. chapters. No, I, they're my favorite, Scott. I want them to stay around. Okay, well, you'll probably get your wish. Yeah, okay. Uh, the merchants try to demand that Fault Line's crew compensate them for stealing the cauldron vials, and Fault Line just stonewalls, and Hook Wolf chastises them for arguing at, at, at their meeting. Yeah, this is funny because it's like even um, even as the group has like covered way more ground in Brockton Bay and is probably more powerful than they have ever been, um, they're still not given any kind of respect at all. Yeah. And it's because they don't deserve them because they're bad at naming their superheroes. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah that is interesting because now apparently they have way more, they have way more capes now, but also they got really embarrassed by Fall Line's crew. So they've yeah. fallen and standing yet again. So the travelers arrive uh, and then Coil does. And of course they're all pretending not to know each other still. And then uh, uh, they signal the heroes to come which is a surprise to, I think, most of the people there. And the protectorate team does does arrive. I don't recall who exactly is with them, but it's got at least Miss Militia and Battery. Yeah, I think that's it, right? I mean, oh, no, there's yeah, some wards with them. There's some wards with wards. them, too. Okay, all yeah. right, all right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Hoke Wolf opens the meeting, and he cleverly uses his opening remarks to make a move against the Undersiders and Travelers, who he knows have been gradually taking over the city. Um, and the other villains are unhappy to realize that these two teams are indeed working in concert to carve up the city between them. 
um, Hook Wolf proposes that everyone agree to release their hold on their territories until the nine have been dealt with. Yeah, and and I uh, I gave Hook Wolf a really hard time last week, um, but this is this was clever the way he orchestrated this. Uh, he kind of backed them against the wall, and he knew that they weren't going to want to do it. But I mean, it, it just goes to show you that like even a mu- when there's all these super powerful slaughterhouse nine people like these guys are still just playing games and they're still just trying to one up each other and manipulate each other. Um, even with this big, huge looming threat. Right. So, um, yeah. So, so basically they don't, they don't want to do that obviously, but Coyle doesn't really help at all. He's, he throws them under the bus and actually says, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, but when he's challenged, um, he, he does end up telling everyone about the whole end of the world, uh, prophecy with Jack. Um, yeah, I don't know about you, but Jack finding out about this prophecy uh, would be really bad, in my yeah. opinion. I, I think yeah. he's a type of person that would hear that and go, "Interesting. Let's see if right. I can make that happen." Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that we have all these ele- like even in just in this scene, we have that element on the table. We have the fact that that the, the teams are meeting here in order to to form a new kind of alliance against the nine. And what ends up happening is, of course, that the travelers and undersiders refuse to back off from their territories, and and Miss Militia proposes a compromise, which is rejected, and then the two coil supported teams are just completely kicked out of the meeting. Yeah, I like this a lot too. I, I like I like Miss Militia's little beat, um, where she like like Taylor basically pulls her aside and is like, "Look, you need to help us, like for the interest of everyone," and like she tries. And like, I love that little moment where she like looks to her as if I said, as if to say, sorry, I tried. And yeah. it's just like, Miss Melissa just seems like one of the most decent people we've met in this story so far. Um, so I'm sure we'll learn something about her that takes that away. Because every <laughs> time, every time I start to think of characters, oh, you're just good. Then we learn something yeah. terrible about them. But um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say we've been in, we've been in her head already, and we haven't learned that she secretly takes over people's bodies. So yeah, that's can't true. Be too much worse. <laughs> that's true. Um, I I do I do think this says a lot about Taylor because Taylor's kind of the one that led the charge in saying no to this. Um, especially we learn later that like the only reason Brian like pushed saying no was because he heard her say it first. Right. Um, but like again, she's so for- focused on the short term, right? Like she looks at this and says. Um, I can't give up my territory because it'll put me behind. And if I put behind, then Coy won't be as impressed with me. And then I won't be able to free Dinah. And like, they're in the middle of like fighting eight, like super powerful people. Um, and she, like, she, she, she can only focus on that. Like that's like her one goal. And she can't, she can't do anything that hurts that at all. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of Dinah, I think it was interesting that we got a little bit of, um, you know, just some, some interaction on that there. I thought it was cool that, that Weld, yeah, Weld is, is there because he, he like has the, the brain wave while he's standing there and he and he's like, I know I know how you know that. It's because you have kidnapped Dinah Alcott. And then Coyle, you know, very smoothly says, no, I didn't kidnap her. I'm I'm helping her deal with her powers and, and uh, I'm I'm a good guy, you see. And, and we have a deal and uh, no, nobody can talk to her because it would it would interfere with her powers and set her back. So I've got you all wrapped up in a nice little bow. Well, can't argue with that. Thanks, Coyle. Yeah, yeah. I guess you're right, Coyle. Okay. It, I like like he lies so well that it makes me think he just used his power and like knew that that question was going to be asked or something. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. I, I I admit I thought several times during this chapter I was like, so did he have one fork where he just stayed home from the meeting, or is he actually in the meeting and he's using his power? to test to, to a b test different things that he says or like yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's fun to it's fun to think about what what effect he might be having with his power like and, and there's there's the moment where where he where uh the the undersiders and the travelers say no and it's like his head snaps around and he's like no and as, as if he's surprised and it's like well if he didn't like that outcome you'd think he would have found some other way to 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 not have that outcome right but, right they do a lot of speculation as to why coil didn't back them up Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's really tough to say a hundred percent. I think the reasoning that like, he's not going to reveal, like he, it's worth it for him to not reveal the fact that he's working with them. It's like worth the risk makes the most sense to me. Yeah, that makes sense. But I'm sure he's got a long plan cause he always has a long plan. Yeah. All right. So, so back on the shore in chapter 12.3, the team discusses strategy 
the undersiders do, and then they join up with the travelers. Um, and then at this point, they noticed that Imp stayed behind on the artificial island. Uh, and of course, hilariously, there was no mention of Imp at all in the last chapter, even though she was certainly there. <laughs> yeah, I, I like this little detail. Um, it's it's very, like, again, it's the advantage of being in, in first person that, like, Imp's power is to make you forget her. So if you're in someone's head, she's not going to be there. Yeah, right. That's, I mean, Imp's power seems like if you just describe it to someone, it doesn't seem strong at all. But she's like running circles around all these super powerful capes, basically. Yep. So uh, Tattletail reminds Skitter that she was able to hear through her bugs once before, uh, and she realizes that she could try to learn how to do it again reliably. Yeah, Taylor's reaction to being told this is so great, though, because like, it's classic Taylor. She's like, I was able to do something, and you guys didn't tell me that? Um, it, it's really great to me. I really liked it. But it's also kind of surprising to me like how much shit they all give her for it. Like, she basically says, I thought I could do it before, I couldn't get to work, and I gave up. And everyone was like, you? You gave up? You didn't try to learn this thing? <laughs> and it's like, it's like, it's like they're kind of just taking advantage of the fact that she's constantly pushing herself and, like, growing in her power and her understanding of her power. So where they've kind of got greedy with it. Um, and I just, I just like it a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, me too. So uh, from there, they head to Ballistics Lair, which is nearby. Um, and it's located in a mostly demolished parking garage, which has been fixed up by Coil. So all of the villains unmask at this point, uh, and Taylor is the last to unmask. Did that surprise you that they just freely unmasked in front of each other? Um, I, like, cause I know they work for the same person at the moment, but it just surprised me that they're so like casually revealing themselves to each other. Yeah, it, it did surprise me because, you know, like, we know that basically the tra the travelers kind of run around inside Coil's base unmasked because it's like their home apparently, um, which is, I guess that's just that's just what it is. Um, but the Undersiders haven't been that free with their identities except amongst themselves. So yeah, I guess they're I guess they're basically at this point they're it's like the the Undersiders and the travelers are really carving up the city between them and they're all working for coil so i guess there's a good argument there and we've already seen that taylor is less and less careful with her identity so her yeah. her doing it doesn't surprise me so much as yeah. the fact that everyone else did actually yeah it, it is a really good way of quickly showing trust without like saying do we trust each other um, yeah. so yeah i also really like that taylor kind of description fucks uh, ballistic a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> um and like he says like if he had asked me out on a date i would have said yes and like now I can't stop imagining ballistic like accidentally using his power while they're banging and like uh -huh. sending someone flying across the room. <laughs> like in my head, this is really funny. Yes. Like like the girl glory girl uh, episode, except except glory girl's invulnerable and that's why she didn't just disintegrate. So, <laughs> or at least that's what I would assume. Yeah, yeah. Uh so yeah, it it's mentioned uh that Noel is their field commander, actually. Or, or was, or, or something, uh, which deepens the mystery. Uh, so they're going to contact Noelle and ask her for her uh, advice in the situation. And Trickster tells Tattletail to lie to Noelle and tell her that they're working on figuring something out for her, but to be vague about their level of progress. Um, and then uh, after they call Noelle and Tattletail pulls this off, we learn that the existence of Dinah is also being hidden from Noelle. Uh, Matt, whoever this, it's driving me crazy who this girl is. I really want to know. Um, and I like this information. It gives me some more hints. It, it makes me think that my, uh, speculation from the other week is probably not true because I was kind of imagining like her as this person that they found like in a lab or something and they like rescued and took with them. But it seems like if she was the leader of their group before all this stuff went down, that that might not be as true. But I like, I, I just, I'm so up in the air on this. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea what to think. Yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, you do, um, you do. <laughs> oh, no, I forgot. That's convenient. Amp used your power on me. <laughs> um, so Trickster and Noel, uh, as they're talking over the Slaughterhouse Nine problem, uh, they sketch out a chess analogy, comparing each of the nine to different pieces on the um, chessboard in terms of tactical advantages. Uh, and I, I like uh, 
kind of I kind of like all their comparisons. It it makes a degree of sense, but I also think it's funny because ballistic is like I think you're stretching this chess metaphor a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because they are like it's yeah. it doesn't really work, but they're just a just a bunch of nerds. Yeah, I think they're they're just kind of working through the problem really. Um, so yeah, so the, they guess that Cherish's offensive range is less than her sensing range which I don't even know if we know whether that's true or not, but it makes sense. Um, and yeah, it was they, Alec they get, that said it, so I tend to believe it. Yeah, I think so. And and they also guess, or Taylor puts forth, that maybe she can do more damage from further away than Cherish can, even even if Cherish can sense her. It's probably true. And they talk about Bonesaw in terms of being someone who changes the rules and being not just a medical tinker, but the medical tinker, uh, which, which is, I think, new information. Like, we... We we haven't really had a full sense of how rare that kind of thing is. We do know that she came after Panacea, as if Panacea was something special and, you, and like a unique compliment for her. And the idea that Bonesaw is the medical tinker, I think, is a, a kind of a, a validation of that. Yeah, I like I like it better this way a lot. Um, and if we didn't get confirmation as to exactly who the Cauldron Vile people in the Slaughterhouse Nine were at the end of this arc. Um, I would probably be speculating that Bonesaw is one of them because it, it, if it's so rare, it seems like something that would have been specifically created in a lab or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, I think I think the reason it's probably so rare is because it takes just a truly fucked in the head person <laughs> to to yeah. wield a power like this. Yeah. Um, and so that happens to be this little girl. So yeah, right. It's it's one thing when you when you need materials to be a tinker and so you have to join the protector to get materials it's another thing when the only materials you can use are human bodies yeah so, living human bodies uh, so uh, as a strategic paradigm noel uh, noel noel suggests that uh, shogi might be a better fit uh, i don't know how to play nor pronounce that game actually but uh, it, apparently it's a game like chess but you can use the pieces that you capture instead of taking them off the board um, and I guess that the reason they bring this up is that they have Regent's power and they can use Regent to capture people. And they conclude based on this that they should go after Bone, uh, Burnscar and Shatterbird. Yeah, and this is kind of confirmation of something that I was wondering about last week when we just saw that Regent was just casually using his power now. Um, mm-hmm. And I was curious as to how Taylor and the rest of the Undersiders would react to knowing that information. And it seems like they don't care. <laughs> um yeah. Uh, like Taylor just seems fine with it. Uh, I think there's a whole conversation she has with Brian earlier when they're talking about how they're taking territory where Brian specifically mentions that he's using minions and he's using the power this way. Um, and she, I guess she made that decision that it was okay with Sophia and then is just fine with it in general now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think also in this particular case, we are talking about the nine and like, I think, I think we as a culture condone a different level of, of unilateral force against, like some drug dealer than we do against Osama bin Laden. Um, so, so it kind of makes yeah. sense there that you would be like, ah, I'm not really feeling too bad about doing this to Brin's car and Shatterbird, yeah. but yeah, I mean, but, but, I, but still, yeah, I think your point is stands regardless. I think it just speaks to a larger just level of acceptance among the group um, yeah, of this thing. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So um, it seems like uh, the big Cape meeting is over because they see all the capes, uh, or that they they learn from Genesis rather that all the capes have left, um, so they head out to retrieve. They start to head out to retrieve Imp, and on the way out, the team um, grasps that that bastard, the puppy that Rachel is holding, is a wolf pup. Not the name of this little tiny wolf is Bastard, so they're bitching Bastard, and I love this so much. And it's this cute little wolf pup named Bastard. Yes. <laughs> I love it so much. And if this dog dies, I will literally stop reading this book and cancel the podcast and we'll never right. go on the internet again. Okay. That's yeah. That's it, it is, it is really kind of sweet to think of how like troubled Rachel is at, at this time and that she's almost kind of clinging to this puppy. Like she's taking it everywhere with her. And yeah, she has her pragmatic reason for taking it, but also like we saw inside her head and, and, and we saw what, what, siberian offered her and uh it's interesting to imagine where she is right at this moment yeah it it does it definitely comes off as kind of a security blanket and i think taylor's kind of very rational observation that bringing a puppy to this villain meeting probably does not make a lot of sense is meant to show that um that yeah yeah, she's she's 
latching onto this thing. She needs it right now. Um, and yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's sad. And please don't, Wild Bo, please don't hurt this, this puppy. <laughs> please, please. He, he can hear you, Scott. I know. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's too late, though. It's set it in stone. You may go, maybe just, go back and edit the chapter before uh-huh. I read it. Please. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so then they just happen to run into Siberian Jack, Bonesaw, and Cherish on the way out of the parking garage. And Jack quotes American Psycho at them. <sighs> if I didn't hate fucking Johnny Depp enough already... He has to quote American Psycho. Yeah. You know the only thing worse than people obsessed with American Psycho? What? Is people obsessed with Fight Club? Yeah. This is freaking people that like American Psycho. Oh, he's so he's such a badass. Like, no, you're you're understanding the movie wrong. Stop. Yes. Go check out our podcast on Fight Club for some context yeah, for that. Or we what? totally deconstruct. Like, Fight Club is a satire of that lifestyle. You're not supposed to be. <laughs> watching the movie and wanting to live, wanting to start your own fight club. If you watch fight club and start your own fight club, you're stupid. <laughs> I think that's a direct line from that podcast. I think so. I think it's like our, yeah. it's like our third episode. We, yeah. It was, it was funny because almost all of us in the course of the discussion realized how ridiculous we'd been as young people. But anyway, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a digression a little bit. So uh, yeah, 12.4 opens and um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so Lisa immediately calls out Jack on his stupid quote, which is amazing. And Lisa is my favorite. Yeah. Uh, so Skitter rapidly thinks through the possible tactics that could be applied here. And she settles on using her bugs and Gru's darkness to escape out the back. Um, but Cherish senses that she has settled on a plan and calls it out, uh, which basically derails the plan. Um yeah, I like this a lot. Um, I think it shows, you know, we think of emotions in rather simplistic terms, but like this shows like how much of your action is related to emotion. And so if you have a person that can read emotions, like you're just able to suss all this stuff out like that. Um, like it's almost similar to how Tattletale operates. Yeah, that, that's really that's a really cool observation. And I, I never thought of it that way. But yeah, it, it, it kind of gives her that edge over people in a, in a situation like this. So you kind of got two two uh, Tattletale alikes in this in this situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, I think we have to to point out the passage where Cherish uh, describes how she perceives Taylor with her power. Um, so I'm just going to read the whole part if that's all right. She, she thinks, she says, actually, when I looked at her with my power before I called her the worm, she spent some time being as low on the food chain as you can get while still being able to move under your own power as low as someone can get while still having an identity of their own. But she's realized she's poisonous, dangerous in her own unique way. She's useful like a silkworm we harvest or an earthworm who works our gardens She's even realized she's not alone as long as she looks for friends among the other dirty, contemptible creatures. The little worm found a nugget of self-worth. She just doesn't want to look too closely at what that nugget is made of. If she's lucky, she's one of the worms without eyes. They might be keenly aware of their environment, but they're happier blind. This is so good. Yeah. See, the, the thing... The thing that I love about this, besides, I mean, we've got our title namesake now. Now I finally understand why it's called Worm. Yay. Um, like, Cheris is, is right here. Like, she's, but but she's also not. Like, it's like, she's pegged Taylor to a T, but, like, Taylor also has been, like, notoriously underestimated. Um, so... I love how she can be both bite right and wrong here. And I love, I love that line. This little worm found a nugget of self worth. She just doesn't want to look too closely at what that nugget is made of. That's so, yeah. that's so right. <laughs> like it's, it's so yeah. true. Um, I just love it. I love the, I love like just the, the pros use like a nugget of self worth. I just, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely an interesting take on Taylor. It's, it's, a. Uh, it's a cynical and kind of negatively slanted take on her. And it's especially in light of how we see her behave later in this arc, it's she's more than she's more than just this, but she definitely, this definitely does describe a lot of, a lot of who she's been and how she, how she's evolved. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, um, to, to quote Wonder Woman, she mm-hmm. is all of these things. 
mm-hmm. but she's so much more. Yes, that's right. Love that movie. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I really do like this. And I like, I like the idea, um, the, the eye imagery, um, there, that she's happier blind. And I like how this kind of ties into the fact that like, like her senses and how she sees things and like how increasingly she doesn't even need to use her eyes to see things and how that relates to that. And like how that could be setting up a, a twist of expectations and that like, Oh, like how that could relate metaphorically to, yes, she's happy or blind. Um, but she's going to be able to see, even if she doesn't have eyes, like mm-hmm. she's a worm without eyes, but she doesn't need them. Um, and I really like, I really like that. And I'm, I, I just, there's so much, there's so much good stuff in here. Yeah. I mean, the, the blindness can be a metaphor for just her compartmentalization and right. blinding herself to things she doesn't want to see. Right. Um, yeah. There's, but, there's plenty, there's, there's a, a I mean, we could, we could, I mean, this. yeah, we could, we could spend 20 minutes on this yeah. couple paragraphs alone. Um, yeah. bottom line, uh, I think we're, we're absolutely both kind of right here that this is true and not true simultaneously. This is, this is a part of her. Um, it is a crazy villain's perspective on her. Um, and she's so much more than this. And my fear is that she is aware of that. Like my fear mm-hmm. is that like the important thing is, does Taylor know that she's so much more than this or does Taylor hear this and think this is me? Um, and you know, that's, that's the the big thing here. Yeah. She doesn't seem to spend a too long, uh, like a whole lot of time dwelling on what Cherish says about her actually. No, she doesn't. I was kind of a little surprised, but I think there's just too much going on. Yeah. Um, right. But I, I think, I think her actions are kind of reflected in it though. I think her constant, her constant fear of people finding who Taylor is, um, is reflected on kind of how she, that, that this kind of supports that. And, and mm-hmm. you, you know, when you think, when you think about Cherish and you think how her power works and how she came to this information, it was by reading Taylor's emotions. It was by reading how Taylor feels about herself. Um, right. and so, uh, you know, I think there's a part of her that knows this is true. Um, and, and I hope that, I hope that she can get past that part. Yeah. I mean, especially considering even after she does some amazingly heroic things later in this arc, she still feels like a worm, which like you say, if you're just reading her emotions and not, not realizing what she's doing, it paints a different picture of, of who she is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't wait to get into that further in the, in the chapter. And I think we can, we can make sure to relate it back to this conversation because I think the rest of the arc kind of hinges um, metaphorically around this couple paragraphs. I agree. So at this point, the nine start talking about the tests that they're going to uh, apply to their applicants or their, their candidates rather. Um, so bone saw is very concerned that her test be fair. And, uh, she lets on that Rachel was chosen, which is something that no one else except Rachel knows yet. And Taylor's understandably, uh, finds it a bit ominous that Rachel didn't mention this. Yeah, but we kind of understand, right? We understand that Rachel's struggling between, is she part of the pack? Is she alone? So it kind of makes sense that she would want to deal with this on her own. Um, I still do not think Rachel will be go with a nine, especially I think the more we learn about the tests, like the more anti that Rachel seems to be like, she's not going to jump through hoops. Like Rachel's not the type of person who's going to like, like willingly disfigure themselves for your entertainment. Like that's just not the type of person she is. So like, I, I, I'm more convinced than ever that this is not going to be something she wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so mannequin, uh, mannequin's test is always to ask the candidates to alter themselves in a way that costs them something. Siberian waits until half the candidates have been discarded and then hunts the remainder. Um, and apparently nobody passes every test and the punishment for failing a test is up to the individual who assigned it. And sometimes it is death, but sometimes it's something different. Um, but whatever it is, it's always worse than death. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. So Regent asks Cherish what she did for her tests and Jack tells them. Um, apparently she killed Hatchet Face, which I guess made an opening for her or I forget how that worked exactly. And then uh, Bonesaw gave her a parasite that would kill her if she didn't drink enough blood, uh, which was left vague on purpose, uh, which is also delightful. Um, Shatterbird locked her in a room with a shard of glass that edged toward her for probably days. We're not sure how long. Uh, Mannequin made her change herself. uh, And and, uh, what she does is she gets horrible, ugly tattoos all over her body. 
And then Jack made her do all six tests again, which is actually not very creative at all. No, it's not. It's pretty <laughs> boring, Jack. You suck, Johnny Depp. Um, this I mean, it is, would suck to do, though. Yeah, I mean, it would. This, uh, this made me so uncomfortable. Like, the mm-hmm. tattoos. For some reason, the image of the tattoos really got to me. I mean, they're just described so disgustingly. Like, yeah. I, and I don't even know if a visual medium could do that justice, you know? Like, yeah. I, I have an image of it in my head, and I don't know if it could ever match up to that. Um, and, and and Jack's casual talk about, when he talks about liminality and the transformation, mm-hmm. like, that's that really got me. Like, how casual he is about this, and how, like, proud he is. Oh, that's horrifying. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's quite a monster. Um, it, we, like we, we make fun of we make fun of his like pretentiousness, but underneath the pretentiousness, he is actually a monster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Tattletale at this point starts tattling and reveals that Cherish is manipulating the Nine in a way, well, essentially in the way that she was thinking about in her interlude uh, before, where she's making them addicted to her more or less. Um, and Jack is really annoyed that that Tattletale revealed this. Because he already knew, and he was planning to one-up Cherish um, by surprising her when she tried to pull that trick on him. Uh, and he, in retaliation, slashes Lisa's face open with his power from across the garage. Um, and the good villains uh, try to do first aid on her horribly bleeding wound while the nine natter at each other. Yeah, I wanted to point out the the writing here because I love it. Um like this, the, the the texture of it, like all at once, Tattletale stopped talking and I was blind. In that same instant, something slapped against the fabric of my face, of my mask, wet. I could taste it against the fabric, salty, sweet with a faint metallic taste. Like the, the, like the, it just, it's tangible. Like you can feel yeah. it and it's like so sudden and shocking and like horrifying. I just loved it. Yeah, right. It's. It, the, uh, this scene actually um th- this moment where where he gets telltale with the knife was is just one of those things that's kind of stuck with me and and uh i see it as being one of the like uh emotionally resonant moments for, for some reason i mean it, I, I guess i could think about why that might be but like this you know telltale is always mouthing off at people sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't sometimes people ignore her but this is the time where Jack just is annoyed with her, so he just practically kills her and slashes her across the face. And, yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's nothing. Like it's nothing. Yeah. And there was, and no one, none of them could do anything about it. None of their powers, nothing. Yeah, right. That's so good. So at this point, while while uh, Tattletail is bleeding out, Jack offers them a couple of warnings. First, that Bone Saw uh, Bone Saw has installed some kind of biological agent in the city that acts through water which will be activated if all the players don't cooperate with the game. Uh, and Shatterbird is going to announce herself in like 34 minutes or so. So basically everyone's fucked. Yeah. As if Brockton Bay hasn't been through enough. Right. This, it's not destroyed enough. There's more things that are standing. So, so uh, bleeding out, unable to speak, Tattletail scrawls some words and communicates through Taylor, offering a different deal to Jack. That if more of the candidate, uh, more than half of the candidates are left at the end of the tests, then Brockton Bay wins and the nine leave. Yeah. So one of the things they talked about when they were using their nerdy board game metaphors um, was changing the game, taking the game that the nine had and changing it to a game that better suits them. I I don't quite see how this all works out in their favor. How this is really more advantageous for them, um, other than you know, if we beat you, you'll leave. Like, it's almost as if, like, we know we can't kill you all, so the only way we can make you to leave is to bargain with you to literally leave. Um, and I guess that makes sense. Um, I, I think I think it's cool because it plays into uh, both Jack and Bonesaw's weaknesses. Um, like, the fact that it's established that she wants fairness and he always wants to make things interesting. And again, it shows us how effective Tattletale is, even yeah. with her face, like, falling off. Yeah, I, th- I think the idea here is that without this proposed deal, um, basically all of the candidates but one would die, and whoever the one was would go off with the nine. So, so essentially, all of the people whose names you know we, we've been told are the candidates would be killed, and Telltale doesn't want that. So, um, so this way, the the candidates 
survive the tests um and then the nine leave before they you know finish i'm not sure if i'm right about that i might be misunderstanding what no, the i, I think you're was. right i just think it's like it, it shows a confidence in their ability to pass the tests without dying <laughs> that i don't know if i uh fully agree with at this point considering yeah. how powerful they are but right. and we'll see i mean there's not much else you can do in this point so uh I, I i appreciate the plan i appreciate how it works playing with yeah. the characters and and I appreciate how it raises the stakes yet again because it's like well things are things are still dismal but there there's now a, a, a tiny sliver of hope that we could save all of our characters who we care about. Yeah, and it almost forces the candidates to have to work together. So even though the different groups in Brockton Bay are separated right now, um, like they need more than half the candidates to survive, right? That's the, the yeah. thing. So they need to work together. They need to team up. Um, yeah. Right, so that was a clever reversal of of the drifting apart, yeah. P- potentially, yeah. So uh, twelve point five opens, and uh, the the nine. So, so at the end of the last chapter, the nine leave. Telltale tells Taylor to go, and she takes off toward her dad's house. And as she's uh, as she's leaving, she thinks about killing Jack and the other non invulnerable nine uh, as she's as she's leaving, and. Um, thinking to herself about how it would save billions of lives because she knows about the uh, Dinah's prophecy about Jack. Um, and she chooses not to kill him, but instead chooses to save as many people as she can instead as she runs. And she thinks to herself about the difference between the people she's left to die and the act of killing someone, even someone like Jack. Yeah. And this is, I think what we were talking about a few chapters ago with you know, four chapters ago, um, she sat down with Charlotte and she said, she explained her moral outlook and she explained it with confidence and assuredness that she knows like there is nothing that um, with, with the exception of rape, there is nothing that you can't justify. Um, there's no action that you can't justify in some way or another. Um, and now she's like faced with the reality of that. Um, and suddenly it, it's like, Oh shit. Like th- it, things are a lot more <laughs> complicated than that kind of posturing. Like, things are harder than that. Um, it's, it's one thing to talk about being able to do that kind of stuff. It's one thing to try to reason your way into that stuff, but actually do it is different. And she's like being attacked. Like this, that's what the slaughterhouse nine is doing to her. That's the, the, the overall arc. I think of these people are pushing her understanding of her own morality and what she is and is not willing to do. Um, what's right, what's wrong. How do you justify that? What am I yeah. willing to do? And I love, I love it. I love it so much. Right. Yeah. Cause I, I think there's definitely a, a framing where killing Jack here is, is like the right thing to do, but she's not, she's not at a point where she can just make that decision, even though she may have thought she was. Right. Yeah. And I love that this is happening, you know, while she's running. And I love that in this moment, like she's wrestling with all this stuff and, but she's Taylor. So she's an active protagonist. She acts. Um, so she makes her choice and she says, um, as much as a small part of me wanted to make the heroic sacrifice, I couldn't throw away my life for the mere chance to kill him. And I definitely couldn't throw away the lives of others. Yeah. And that, I mean, that is Taylor. Like, like there's, there's moments where she makes bad choices. There's moments where she justifies things that make me uncomfortable to see her justify. Um, but that is Taylor, the hero in that moment. Um, that's yeah. when she transcends this, this conflict and makes her decision and grows as a person. Um, and I think we're going to see that play out. And I'm not saying that Taylor's like, like not going to have real problems with her own sense of morality, but in this moment, that's wonderful. Yeah. And, and this is not only a highly dramatic scene, but also a highly cinematic one, I think. Uh, and I think we talked about this earlier, how this isn't like a battle between superheroes, but but I, I, I just can very easily imagine this, how this would look and how this would feel, you know, on, on a screen where she's she's running and running. She's waking everyone up with their bugs. Uh, she's multitasking a billion different ways and solving complex problems all at once and using her bugs to create drawings. And in the meantime, while she's doing this, she calls Sierra at the hospital and Charlotte in her, in her territory, tells them to spread the word about the attack that's coming. Um, she's running into these phys- physical obstacles that she's not quite able to get around, you know, e- even with her, her cleverness. Yeah. Um, it, re- really slowing her down. She keeps looking at the, you get this tick, ticking clock aspect where she's running and she'll find an obstacle. She'll look at her clock and it'll be 
it'll be, oh, I, I can't imagine that. How did, how did 10 minutes pass? Um, and, uh, and in the end, I also like the, the, the description of how the, uh, it, like a, uh, something, the, a bullet the size of a, of a, what was it? I don't remember. So, so, some, some giant impact is essentially the sense she gets and all, and all the glass in the city shatters yeah. and she isn't quite quick enough to get home before it hits. Um, but luckily her dad has taped up the windows uh, of, of his bedroom. So he only gets, uh, well, yeah, he gets pretty badly sliced up actually, but, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, but non-fatally and Coyle's medics arrive at her house shortly after she does. And they take her dad away while she heartbreakingly leaves him again, which, which may have been the third time that she's walked away from her father. It is. It's a three beat. You're absolutely right. I'm yeah. glad you pointed that out. Um, because, you know, the whole thing with the three beat is the third time uh, subverts it a little bit. So the first mm-hmm. time she kind of willingly walked away from the first two times, she kind of willingly walked away from her father. And this is really the first one where she really doesn't want to. Um, she wants to stay with him, um, but she can't. Yeah. Um, and, and right. you know, this is this is so good because like this chapter, we have her, you know, we just talked about we had her struggling. We had her struggling with her morality. We had her make this choice. And like she makes this choice, I have to save these people. I have to do this. I have to get to my dad, and she fails. I mean, she saves a lot of people. I'm not going to take that away from her. She does, but she doesn't get to her dad on time. Um, a lot more people died, and it's this lesson in like, look, Taylor. Even even when you're being heroic, even when you're trying to save people, you're not you're not going to be able to save everyone. Like you just, it's not going to happen. And the biggest fear for me with that is that she makes this choice and then she fails to save people. And we're going to see this more in the next two arcs. And then she looks at that as almost like a, a way of saying, why bother? You know, like I'm Mm going to beat myself so much up so much. I failed. Like it doesn't even make any sense to do it, even though she saved a shit ton of people. Um, and, and that's why I love how this, this chapter ends. Um, like, where she says, fuck all this, fuck the Nine, fuck Shatterbird, fuck Jack, fuck Leviathan, fuck Coil, fuck Hookwolf, but fuck me most of all. And it's like, Taylor, what? <laughs> like, it, they did this. You didn't do this. You saved people. Um, and, like, it, it ties into her compartmentalization, right? Yeah. And it's just like, like, it, she can't, she can compartmentalize terrible actions, but like when she feels like she has failed, she cannot let that go. And yeah. that's dangerous. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as we'll see in a little bit, she has a really hard time giving herself credit for when she does good stuff. We saw that in the Leviathan fight too, though. Like yeah. she, she did great things. She, she, she managed to be annoyed that no one was grateful to her, but she's not even terribly grateful to herself. Like she doesn't, she doesn't give herself credit on the inside. You know, yeah. she, she has this sort of self self loathing thing, which well, I think is what earns her the worm title. Yeah. And that's the, that, that, exactly. That's what I was going to say. It ties back to that image of her as the worm. And, and I love that. And I love, you know, it hadn't even occurred to me until we were talking about it, that Ch- Cherish's power only lets her see what people think of themselves. So mm-hmm. like when she's outlining the, the stuff that that's exactly it. And, and I love that. And I love how that reinforces, you know, she's doing all these things. She's making these life or death situations. She's a 15 year old girl saving hundreds of lives. Um, and yet she fails. Fuck me. Most of all. Yeah. Um, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's kind of scary. It makes me worried about her, but like, it's so like, that's, that's the thing about the story is like, you want to celebrate them at, at the same time as be like, Oh no, like <laughs> it's so hard to, to process it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought th- those those two chapters we just got through. Actually, yeah, this whole arc is is, is really stand out in terms of like moments that stuck with me from from the series. Like, yeah, it, it actually surprised me how many of these moments that I was like, oh yeah, this this scene, and this was like chapter after chapter after chapter of like scenes where I was like, oh yeah, that was a a watershed moment in in the in the story. Yeah, twelve five yeah. especially like just the, how it moves, like the yeah. pace of the chapter, like it matches. It's not any shorter than any other chapters, but it feels like the quickest read because like it's just moving. Yeah, she's she's running for most of the chapter. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, very very kinetic. So twelve point six opens with Taylor um, thinking about how the damage from the sand is in some places worse than from the glass because there's actually less glass than there could have been due to Leviathan's devastation. Yeah, at first I was like uh, sand, and then I was like, oh yeah, sand. <laughs> 
fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So she makes her way to her territory, uh, and the people there are pretty messed up um, by by the sand and and some by the glass. Uh, so two two of the uh, two ambulances are there. I'm never actually clear on whether these are coils or not, but but they're uh, there, there's some paramedics, uh, and she tries to take charge, uh, asking unhurt people to step forward, but nobody does until Charlotte finally finally steps forward and and pretends to be some random person. Good job, minion. Yeah. <laughs> so Skitter uses her power to find people who are trapped and injured and sends people to help them. Um, and then she has she has to deal with RJ's dad again. Um, yeah. And, and you, you pulled out this quote. Worse, I couldn't help but feel like he was seeing through the image I was trying to portray. Seeing the girl behind the mask who was just trying to pretend she knew what she was doing. Yeah. And again, I think this is Taylor projecting a little bit. Um, this is her feeling about herself and projecting it on this man. And he might on some level be doing that. I mean, he can probably tell she's a little girl, but, um, I, I think it's just more that this guy's just a dick. Uh-huh. Um, and I think Gru's actual interpretation of him early in the chapter was probably spot on that he wants to feel mainly and powerful and uh, like useful. And she's kind of like making him not useful. So he's going to push back. Um, mm-hmm. but, but she's projecting like she, it it goes into she wants to separate the Taylor from the skitter and she's going to project this in order to reinforce the fact that she needs to separate those two. Yeah, totally. So she starts uh, retrieving a bunch of useful things from her lair using her bugs while she's in in that moment kind of still continuing to organize people. She's bringing markers to mark where injuries are and uh, to mark whether they've had tetanus shots recently. Yeah, you forgot to mention the part where she uh, had her swarm pick all this stuff up, and then she just, like, reaches into the air, and a marker materializes <laughs> it to her hand. <laughs> it's just, like, super casual, no big deal. Just, yeah. Just raising my hand and getting whatever I need. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah, so so she's she's moves everyone into the into the warehouse to, to wait their turn to be, to be fixed up, and at this point, she has a run-in with the gray-haired woman, which is how I'm going to refer to her, who challenges Taylor's authority and, and knowledge and criticizes the lack of sterility of her bugs. So it's interesting here because this woman's challenge is a lot more concrete than, than the dad from earlier, who, who's really just being a jerk, like you said. But, but this woman is like basically pointing out like, hey, you know, I don't think that's correct. And what's funny to me here, or, or at least interesting, is that um, Taylor seems to just be making things up as she goes along to justify herself and kind <laughs> yep. of be defensive. Like she's like, "X-rays can't see glass. I mean, small pieces of glass. No, oh, here, here's some hydrogen peroxide. Oh, it it delays wound recovery. Well, that it's good that it delays re- wound recovery because <laughs> <laughs> over here, everyone. Um, and it's like this woman probably does know more about like medical care than Taylor, but Taylor's Taylor's like, look, I'm, I'm trying to organize everyone and help people. And you kind of just need to defer to my authority because you're just messing up my, my rhythm here. Gray haired woman. Would you, would you say she's like bullying them a little bit? I, I might, uh, I might say that <laughs> she's being a bit of a bully toward, uh, toward the gray haired woman here. Yeah. And I love, I love that. Like as soon as she sees this, woman push back on her she calls her a school teacher uh-huh. um and that's that's fits so much in taylor's mindset is like some strict bossy person they must be a authority figure in a school because that's yeah. my experience with school authority figures um but she's not she's a doctor and like she yeah. she runs a clinic and she knows what she's talking about and she's actually qualified and she should probably be uh having this woman help her right yeah so which is just tragic actually um, so she notices outside with her power that the paramedics are dead and she checks on them personally and finds that they've been slaughtered by someone with a blade. And then she heads back into the warehouse and finds mannequin giving her the T-1000 finger, uh, chastising her <laughs> essentially for saving people. And then he immediately kills the gray haired woman right in front of her. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. So I... I have to say that this is a pretty awesome setup. We've got this warehouse full of hurt, scared people who can all see what's happening. And we see Taylor pull out her combat knife and her non-lethal baton against this like armored nine foot tall creature with telescoping sword arms with a perfect counter to her power, basically. And she responds to this by snarling threats at him in her swarm voice. I love it. I love it. 
it's like, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'm going to make you fucking regret it. Yeah. Uh, it's so, it's so good. Yeah. yeah. And it, this is a really good cliffhanger too. And like, it's cool because like 12, five was this really super tense chapter. Um, and 12, six kind of releases that tension a little bit until the end where it's just like, no, just kidding. Boom. And like, you're suddenly like, I don't think has Taylor fought someone like alone since the beginning, like since long, I don't know if she's been totally completely alone in a fight. Um, I don't think she has. I can't recall. And and even even that, I think she sort of benefited from being from being bailed out by the undersiders. Right, right. She's so, totally alone here. Like cell phones don't work. She can't call anyone. Like no one's coming. Yeah, that's that, yeah. That, that's that's one detail I always forget until until the story points it out that that cell phone cell phones don't work. So she couldn't even get back up if she wanted it. Yeah. Yeah. So. 12.7 opens and uh, they start to fight and she gets owned pretty quickly because she's just fighting hand to hand. She's not really using her bugs um, to much advantage at all. Uh, but luckily, when he pins her down and slashes her throat, he doesn't realize that it's ineffective due to her armor. Um, but I do. I love how she makes her, all of her bugs look like they've died to accentuate <laughs> the, the illusion that she's dead. It's a very quick thinking. Yeah, totally. I, I I think that would be, and I like that like someone screams in response. It's it's this great image. So while she's lying there playing dead, she analyzes him as an opponent, like you do, and uh, she <laughs> reasons that most of his important organs in his brain are probably in his torso. Um, and she thinks about how bugs crack into their shelled prey. Yeah, I think this is the probably the most impressive we've seen Taylor so far. Um, this fight, this fight from beginning to end, from how she analyzes him from how she like dives into what she knows about him to come up with a way of defeating him um, is so great. And I, I, you're absolutely right that like, he's like the perfect counter to her. She even says it's like he's made, like he specialized in ecosystems and keeping like nature and stuff out of places. And he's built that around him. So like uh, it's so good. Like this is the perfect person to put her up against. Um, Yeah. And, and it's really great. Yeah, the, the the tension here is pretty incredible. So uh, she she does come up with a plan, but we're not privy to it because it's more fun this way. Um, so as she starts executing it, she stands up and a mannequin attacks a defenseless mother and child. And this basically forces Skater to throw herself into harm's way to save them. And then uh, she ends up scuffling with him a bit more and barely surviving as he uses his ridiculous weapon body against her. Yeah, I mean, this is classic, like, hero-villain fight. Like, this is what villains do in fights. They, like, they know that the the heroes... Like, Superman's weakness is that he has to save people, and people use that against him all the time by, like, yeah. throwing people off buildings and stuff and making him go chase after them. So this is, like, I mean, vintage hero-villain stuff, and it's great. Um, I really like how when you use the word tension a, f- a few seconds ago, um, I want to talk about tension and stakes in these fights. I think, I think we can wait till the end of the fight to do that, but r- remind me that I want to talk about that. Cause I sure. think that's really great. And I like how it, they do it in this, this whole fight. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So eventually, um, she swamps him with bugs that appear to do nothing at first, but they gradually try to squeeze into his body through the little cracks and crevices. And this doesn't work because once they get inside, he kind of like incinerates them. Uh, so he, he has defenses even on the inside. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I like this a lot too, because um, it, it's showing that even with her brilliant plans, like I think there's a tendency sometimes to think, and I catch myself doing it so often is like Taylor's too smart. Like she's mm-hmm. like, she's like too resourceful and she comes up with these plans almost too quickly. But what we see with stuff like this is she's really just probing him for weaknesses and she's just trying different things and not all of them work like this fails. So like, yeah. I think that's very realistic and, and, and helps like, lend credibility to her ability to um to suss out this kind of stuff yeah and it makes him seem like a more formidable opponent because like if it's like yeah mannequin one of the nine really 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 tough oh and like the first thing taylor thought of you know just defeated him no it's it's, yeah. it's more it's more believable if it's like yeah he is smart he's he's thought of the first thing you've thought of he's also thought of you're gonna have to <laughs> yeah you're gonna have to go a little bit farther than that yeah so she holds him at bay for a while longer um, and then her big swarm that she's been assembling and bringing from her lair arrives and the swarm passes over mannequin multiple times using this complicated visual pattern that, that I think is 
I, I bet everyone imagines it differently, but it's uh, I like how it's described nonetheless. Um, and uh, the first the first pass basically she deposits web on him, which does very little at first, but she does several passes and it quickly adds up. Yeah, I imagined uh, Ride of the Valkyries. <laughs> These bugs flew yeah. in, were dropping web. Um, it's just a really cool image. I think it's it's great. It, it was it's a good idea. Uh, the execution, the visual of it in my head is is perfect. Yeah, that's. I mean, I, I love how these these little clever tricks are doled out over the course of of the series, where we it's been twelve arcs, and we're finally seeing her have you know flying insects carry spiders and basically create a flying web delivery device, which is you know very very clever and and the kind of thing that she kind of developed organically through uh, you know putting together other tricks she'd figured out and mastering her power more and more. Mm-hmm. So Mannequin sees what she's doing, uh, finally, because uh, his vision doesn't work so well, actually. Uh, he, he senses things in other ways. And uh, then he turns into a blender and starts going after the civilians. And she starts dropping anything gooey from her lair that she could grab onto him, which gums him up in, in, in conjunction with that spider silk. And eventually, he just kind of gets overwhelmed from all this and collapses into a pile. And one of the bystanders helps her grab his head uh, which is attached to everything else by a chain and haul it away and tie it to something which sort of ties him in place. And then she goes to stop him from getting his arm. Um, and, and he goes after her with the nano knife that he took from arms master. Uh, and she's saved by the man who helped her with the head when he starts smashing the head with the center block. Yeah, and just to, that's, that that completes our whole hero metaphor. Just in case it wasn't clear enough that we're that Taylor is a superhero in this moment, that she literally inspired one of her own people to uh, step in and help out. Like that's mm-hmm. that's what superheroes do. They ins- they do what we can't to inspire us to do what we can. Um, and that's what Taylor did with this guy. Um, yeah. and he saved her, and that's significant. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 pretty awesome to see that. Like I remember I remember that being a. A big fist pump moment while reading this story. Yeah. Uh, so she takes his arm away, uh, Mannequin's arm, because he obviously wants it, and she cocoons it to the ceiling. Um, and he's at this point too messed up to continue fighting. Um, and and he he runs, leaving behind his, I believe his head and his arm. And uh, she feels him, she feels him get uh, three, four, then five blocks away before he's out of her range. Which which I, I remarked on because I thought her range was usually like two blocks or something, which I might be wrong about. But I, I was thinking maybe this is meant to imply that she has a power boost. No, in the situation. I, I think I think it does. I think she was boosted a little bit here. Um, mm-hmm. I think five blocks is probably the most that the most she's been able to do so far. Yeah, that's what I that's what I thought. I, I uh, and it would kind of make sense because I, I can see how she would feel trapped in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so she's at this point, she's one and she's, she's looking at the, at the body of the, of the gray haired woman. Um, and, uh, she's, she's not, she's not doing too well. She's not really letting herself, uh, appreciate the victory. No, no, she, and, and she can't like, like, again, like she feels like she failed. She looks at this dead woman, this woman that died, quote unquote, on her watch. It was not her fault. Definitely was not her fault. She didn't. I mean, and and she blames herself. And I like but there's this really like the moment where she like getting onto her knees um, and just like turned her head and stares into her eyes and said, I'm sorry. And she just sat there for a minute, just looking at her, not knowing what to say. Um, and then I left her eyes open using my fingertips to close her eyes seemed presumptuous and trite. I love that moment. Um, she, it's, it's not her place. I failed you. Like I, I, it's not my place to do that. Um, it's, it's beautiful. And it's really like, it's, it's kind of heroic in that moment. Like I failed you. I'm sorry. Um, and she's not doing, she's not doing her theatrics here. Like fighting these people doing what she did that moment that's all taylor right that's not skitter that's not the the projection she puts on skitter um that's taylor and yeah. that's so important and i think we're going to see in the next chapter the impact of that yeah yeah um i wonder if she would have let herself appreciate it if she had managed to save all of her people 
Probably not. Um, I mean, she'd yeah. still be thinking about all the people that she couldn't save from Shatterbird stuff. Right. Like, yeah, it's she's she's so hard on herself. Yeah. Yeah. Can we so, talk about stakes though? Can we talk about yeah, tension? Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about that a lot here because I thought this was e- even more effective than usual, actually. Yeah. So, I, so here's the thing with stories like this. Um, like I knew reading the story that Taylor was not going to die here. Um, and and a lot of times people say that. And and our friend Michael says that a lot. Like when he watches superhero movies, he's like, "We know the heroes are going to win in the end, so there's no tension, there's no stakes." Um, and I disagree with that sentiment a lot because I don't think the stakes for this fight are: is Taylor going to win or lose? I think the stakes for this fight are: is Taylor going to be able to save these people? Is Taylor going to be able to save these people in a way that's satisfactory to her? Um, and that's the stakes. What is she going to have to do to defeat this guy? Because there's that moment where she needs to buy time for her plan to come to fruition and he's going to go kill innocent civilians. And she could literally just let him buy time by standing there and letting him kill these people, but she doesn't do it. And that's the stakes for me. That's the tension. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that because like, and I guess it's possible in the story that Taylor could die, but I just don't think it's going to happen. Like at least not right here. Um, so that that's 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 why I think this works because this recognizes that and and shifts the stakes to something else and I think that that works really well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could also say the stakes are like are like, is Taylor going to rise to this occasion and be the hero that we kind of know she can be, and uh, and and that's what's so you know fist pumpy about this whole this whole part is that you're right. you're like. You're like, we've, we've really wanted, I think we, we talked about this earlier, how like we, we've wanted her to be a hero this whole time, really. Like we've really wanted her to actually do what she said she wanted to do, which is to be a hero. But, but ironically, she only rises to the point of actually being a hero when she's at the most villainous that we've seen her to this point where she's, she's defending her people and, and risking her life multiple times you know, basically taking injuries for them, um, throwing herself, literally just throwing herself at him without even having a plan just to slow him down from hurting yeah. someone. And, um, and it's, he, he is kind of the antithesis of what she is because she's always, especially we saw this in, in the Leviathan fight. She's, she's always trying to basically do, do things for the greater good and help people. And it seems like, Alan Graham was someone who wanted to to help people and and work toward the greater good, and then he was broken, and now he's this creature who absolutely hates anyone who is like Taylor and wants yeah. to punish them. And we learn later that that's why he's here, right? Because mm-hmm. she saved too many people from Shatterbird, and mm-hmm. that pissed him off, so he came to take her out. Um, yeah. And that's that's really important. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think. You know, when we talk about stakes, when we talk about tension in stories in general, I think that's something we need to keep in mind. Because, like, every time you go sit down and watch a Marvel movie, um, Captain America is not going to die. Um, like, it's just not going to happen. Like, not not in the movie as is presented. Now, it could happen in Infinity War. I don't know. But, like, we have to keep in mind that he's not fighting for his survival in this. He's fighting for who he is as a person. And I think that's that's what good writing does is it recognizes that the stakes are not life life or death in those kind of stories because the hero is probably going to survive um but it's something else it's something more internal it's something more focused and personal um and that's what good writing does and i think that's here um and yeah. i just wanted to draw it out here and it, we, we've seen it a lot in worm like we've seen it in a, a lot of the other fights um but i just wanted to draw particular attention to it here because of how hero versus villain this fight seems yeah, right. Yeah, I, I I would definitely say that the stakes in this are the most emotionally immediate uh, of any in the last, you might even say the last few arcs. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, so we move into 12.8. And Taylor wakes up terribly sore and not in great spirits the next morning. Uh, she takes a cold shower because her lair is pretty trashed and she heads down to have breakfast. But all the cooking supplies were destroyed by a Shatterbird's attack. Yep. Hater, hater. How dare yep. you ruin breakfast? Um, to really compliment Wildbo's writing here real quick, um, the, the pace of this 
introductory to this chapter matches Taylor's mood. Um, there's something like there's some like sluggishness and like it feels like every word has that pain behind it. Um, is like she slowly gets up and shower and the aches and pains and the bruises and how it's described. Like you can feel it. Um, it, it's like the, the, the writing is like worn out. And I think that's yeah. really good. Yeah. I, I, I like the moment when she like, she sees her mirrors shattered and she groans. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, wow, Taylor's actually not very emotive. So groaning actually tells you how miserable she is about this. Right. Right. Yeah. She's, she's rough. This was a rough fight. She barely survived. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, she sends, she ends up sending Charlotte to go meet with Regent and check on things because you can't just call him. And she cleans up the place with Sierra. And uh, Sierra, who is just kind of not sure what to make of her at this point, asks her about the rumor that she wanted to be a hero. Uh, and uh, and um, t- for Taylor's part, in her own mind, she seems to have solidified her narrative that she chose to be a villain because she didn't want to work with people like Arms Master. And I, I don't know if that's exactly how it happened, but that's how Taylor's telling herself the story these days. Yeah, but and then I love I love this interaction because she's projecting again. Mm-hmm. Um, like, uh, this is Sierra talking, right? Or is this Charlotte? I can't uh, keep up. Sierra. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is Sierra. Uh, yeah, um, this is Sierra. So Sierra says that I heard that you betrayed your team, um, that you wanted to be a hero, but um, she paused, couldn't, and then Taylor's like, "No, nah, she changed her mind about that. What she left? What she leave out? Um, I wanted to be a hero and I failed. Yeah. Giving recent events, I wasn't sure I could blame her for thinking along those lines. Here's the thing, though, Sierra maybe was not thinking along those lines. <laughs> I mean, that's Taylor." projecting herself on it. Mm -hmm. Like the reason she asked her about this is because she just witnessed her acting like a freaking superhero. Um, and she's like so confused. Like she has her minions who know they're working for a supervillain and they, they don't know what to do because like they know she's supposed to be a quote unquote bad guy, but they just watched her be a hero. And like, she's like, I think it's one of them looks at her and then looks away and it's like, they can't even look me in the eye right now. And it's like, cause they don't know what to make of you. Like they don't yeah. know. Like, and she's projecting. It's like, it's cause yeah. I failed. It's cause they see me as weak. It's cause I'm useless. And it's like, no, they're like, like kind of like awed by you right now. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it's probably more like, like, it, yeah. Like you just said that they're, they're in awe of her. She's like, she's like Captain America. And she thinks that she's like, you know, like a worm. A worm, and and she's not, she, it's not sinking in. Yep. And yeah. the, and this is and this is and I, I, I we'll hit this beat again, but this is the scary part of all this. This is where it's dangerous because, like, on the one hand, she's being heroic and she's doing great things. On the other hand, she can't get past her own insecurities, and that yeah. is a bad recipe. Yeah. So she uses her bugs to keep cleaning up the glass, and Gru eventually shows up to che- uh, shows up to check on her. And he's frustrated with her for fighting Mannequin when she knew that her odds given by Dinah were really bad. Uh, so apparently her dad is fine and Lisa is more or less fine, but going to have a bad facial scar, um, which, uh, yeah, you, go ahead. No, I, I just I really love this. Um, I love how casual she responds when he freaks out about fighting Mag- Mannequin. Like her first line is, he's not that strong. <laughs> and it's like, Taylor, <laughs> come on. Yeah. Um, and I love this we get to see this diametrically opposed like way of looking at the world between these two people because he literally cannot understand why she would have fought him like to grew run get out of there um do you why would you sacrifice yourself for these people you don't know these people um why would you do that and he can't understand and i think that's that shows like how much of a hero is there in taylor yeah yeah totally the, the contrast is really. Uh, I, we're seeing a lot of contrasts between these two characters specifically, actually. Yeah. And they talk about the personalities of the different group members and Taylor's read on them. I, I like the beat where they talk about, um, where they talk briefly about Lisa and how she doesn't seem to be phased by having a horrific facial scar, and and Taylor says something along the lines of what I would think and, and what we've seen inside Telltale's mind, which is. She probably is bothered by it, but she's going to put on her bravado that she always does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, basically all this prompts Taylor to explain um, the deal with Coil, 
regarding Dinah and how she doesn't expect him to follow through with it actually. And so she's kind of uh, trying to figure out how, how she's going to deal with that when it arises. Yeah. And again, I like that Gru comes off kind of naggy and patronizing here. Um, I think he's actually really well meeting though, because like he talks about how you need rest, you need to stop pushing yourself. Like you're going to break yourself. And, and like he, he means it. And I think he's right, but she can't like, she has to push forward with her goal. She has to keep going and he can't understand that. Um, I, I like this moment a lot. Yeah, me too. So while they're talking, some ex ABB folks approach Sierra outside and the two undersiders go to investigate. And it uh, turns out that they appreciate what Taylor did defending people and standing up to a dangerous cape. Um, and basic, basically, like they, they weren't sure if she was strong or not, but now she's shown that she's strong. Uh, so uh, she gives them a place to stay and uh, has them clean it up. And as they're doing this, more youngsters approach. Yep. So this is it. This is the, the kind of central conceit of, of our arc. Um, we've seen Taylor again and again, like project her insecurities on people. We've seen her again and again, talk about how, um, her, her people can't see her hurt. They can't see her human. They can't see the weak, useless worm underneath her costume. Um, and she has to, she can't be in doubt. She can't show any of this stuff. She has to be perfect, but really that's all kind of bullshit. Um, that's all stuff that Taylor put on herself. And we see that here. Um, because the thing that finally won people over to her side was that she fought mannequin. She got her ass kicked. Um, she was human. She, she defended her people. And then at the end, she knelt down next to the dead body of one of the people that she couldn't save. And she said, I'm sorry. And that, that was a human moment. Like we said, that was Taylor. Um, and people responded to it. And I think that's like, that's so beautiful. And it's like, it, it's was set up from the beginning to now. And I just love it so much. Yeah. And, and, you know, th- like I sat trying to think about this for a really long time, um, trying to figure out how this made me feel because like on the one hand we have Taylor in this super heroic moment, um, like the, the most, the closest to a hero she's ever, ever been. She saved hundreds, if not thousands of lives. Um, she put herself on the line. She almost died like 20 times. Um, but, but again, we're also seeing Taylor, cementing her control as a warlord she doing this heroic thing just got her a bunch of new minions who she's going to order out to further her territory and further her assistance with coil and do all these things um so like i i love that this story we can there's both right and we've talked about this before like we can celebrate her victory and fear for the consequences of of how she feels about herself. But, you know, I can cheer on Taylor, the superhero of recognizing that Taylor, the supervillain is still in there. Um, and we can take a breath and know that today is not the day she'll have, she'll have to make a choice that she can't come back from, but we still kind of know that that day is lurking right around the corner. And I love the duality of it. I love that it can exist at the same time. And I really love this book. I love it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I just talked for a really long time. I'm sorry. That's that's good. It's good. I mean, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing that, that I think maybe, maybe the story is telling us that the world is complicated and, and morality is complicated right. and everything, yeah. everything yeah. is drawn in contrasts because it was really easy for us to be hard on Taylor when she was, when, when she was becoming, you know, a super villain going up against the literal, you know, justice league type type folks. Right. Now she's, now she's a quote unquote super villain, but what she re- really is, is more like a, a a gang leader slash feudal lord who's trying to protect a group of people against like literal monsters like and and it, 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 it things take on a different light just based on on the contrast of it and on the one hand you don't want to forget how we got here but also you want to appreciate the difference between her and these people she's fighting now and uh yeah, this is this. So we're we're deep into the gray at this point, and I love it. Yeah, and I think that almost seems specifically designed to attack me <laughs> and my sense of morality because I, I my sense of morality is pretty rigid. Um, and what this book is doing is I want to come down on this, and I want to be able to say that this action was right, that this action was wrong, that Taylor acted right here, that Taylor acted wrong here, and. I find the further we get into this thing, the less I can do that. Like I, we can go back and listen to some of our old episodes and talk about those actions. And, and both you and I do that. Like I, I hear us do it and I increasingly can't do that anymore. 
um, because it's so complicated and it's so nuanced and like just because something seems wrong, it might not necessarily be just because something seems right. It might not necessarily be like, we're just kind of lost in that gray now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like when, when you're fighting somebody who's this bad, a lot of things can actually be let slide. <laughs> turns out. Yep. All right. So speaking of uh, bad people, let's move on into the first interlude, which is our <laughs> good friend, uh, Jack. Yay. Uh, so, so first of all, um we've got the, it it opens up with Skidmark being Skidmark and introducing uh one of the uh horrible sounding um uh merchants events involving locking people in coffins and doing horrible things to them um and then suddenly Skidmark finds that his organs are outside of his body and his arm is cut off and his helicopter crashes and all of his friends are killed. I think he's probably dead before he can notice that though. <laughs> um, which, which, uh, did make me reconsider my assessment of Jack's power because he's basically like a sniper, but better. Yeah. Yeah. I think we got a, a hint with how effective he was with Tattletail. Um, but yeah, he's just completely destroyed. Like Skidmark didn't even know what hit him. It's yeah. actually really scary as much as I hated Skidmark and I'm kind of glad he's gone now. Yeah. Right. It's it's funny to me. I mean, funny. It's I, I, I like the contrast of having set up the merchants as like, oh, they're a rising force of bad. Guys. Nope, they're all dead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I so, really so, thought they were going to be more uh, more impactful on the story right. when we were first talking about them. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that was even intentional the, the misdirection there. Yeah. So the nine attack the merchants party and they kill many slash most slash all of the people there. Um, <laughs> Uh, or at least the the capes. I think the only cape who we definitively see escape is Scrub, um, which is wonderful because we like Scrub, don't we? Yeah, he's he's gonna stick with that name, huh? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, stay Scrub. Just some way of remembering his friends, the merchants, I guess. <laughs> uh, and, and and it looks like Shatterbird kills Trainwreck. I think. Yeah, that was think. really casually um, done. Like. I think it's just like Shatterbird standing over like a, the remnants of like a machine, like mm -hmm. a, a metal machine type thing, which I guess yeah. we're, we're in Jack's head. So, of course, Trainwreck is not anything significant from Jack's right. point of view. But, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, we get a description of Crawler for the first time. Uh, so, Scott, what's your impression of Crawler here? He sounds like this like crazy, like. A Greek mythology type creature, like just some combination of all these different animals, like six legs, tentacles. Like, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, I get it, but like, I don't, I don't understand where it came from. Like, is, is his resistance to other powers? Like, does he grow new stuff as he becomes resistant? Like, is he one of those 53 mutant type monster capes? I, I I'm, I'm really intrigued. Um, as to why, how, how or why this happened. Yeah, I mean, I think I had a certain impression at this point, but I, I guess that, that I might be contaminating myself with future knowledge, so I'll, I'll, avoid, I'll avoid speaking. Um, uh, we, we do see that Siberian can transfer her nature to the people she's touching, so she can do stuff like grab people, jump off a roof, and everyone just lands like it's nothing, and then she lets go of them, and and, and they're fine because they basically she basically ex extended their extended her invincibility to them, right? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, like this might be the strongest one we've seen so far, I think. And I guess that makes sense because it says specifically she went up against the uh, the protector at the three um, and triumvirate. Yeah, the tri there. Thank you. Um, and was able to leave. Um, yeah. Also, she eats people. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, she's just like a monster. She's like a literal. She's the closest thing to a, just an absolute monster. Because, I mean, if we didn't know she could talk, we we, we never see her talk outside of that one scene with Rachel. Yeah, yeah. So far, so yeah. So they horrific. They horrifically kill tons of people. I believe at one point, she's. I believe at one point, uh, Siberian's like walking along with three people skewered on her arm like a kebab, which, <laughs> which I don't think would make its way into the TV adaptation. Um, well, no, and then Bonesaw like gives a plague that blows people up. Yeah, like, right. Just for fun, uh, and then mannequin eventually shows up, all covered in paint and missing his arm and head, and all the others are super cont contemptuous of him. Yeah, I like this moment a lot because they like he's already kind of embarrassed that he lost, and then they just kind of rub it in. Um, I really, I really like like 
as shitty as the merchants were, like, Faultline's crew kind of still actually had to fight them. I mean, they mm-hmm. won, but they still had to fight them. This whole thing, like, this isn't even a fight. Like, this is just, like, they just wreck house. Like, it yeah. really, it really, we've established now definitively how strong each and every one of these people is. Yeah, totally. That's a good point. Uh, so they discuss the details of the rules that they're going to accept based on Tattletale's suggestions. Yeah, this is like a, a clever little like outline for how the testing is all going to go. Um, it kind of sets the the structure for the next arc or, or two or three or however many it's going to take to go through all this. But So it's like three days for each of them. Uh, if you fail, you get one less day. Um, if you succeed, uh, you get a little more time. Um, it, the fact that they're like talking about this like what we know of the test so far and they're talking about like rules and structure around it kind of adds to the horrifying feeling of it like they're just being so casual about it right it's like this is their entertainment this is this is basically why they're a group is they're like oh well if we're all together then we can play games like this and have more fun so uh so jack thinks about the nine and their various needs at this point he thinks about how how siberian needs stimulation and seems to have a maternal affection for Bonesaw, how Crawler incessantly seeks things that can hurt him, how Shatterbird craves validation, and Burnstar, Burnscar has to be kept in a dangerous mood, but not in a suicidal one, just kind of balanced between those two. Um, Mannequin has his mission to make sure that we can't have nice things, and um, <laughs> he thinks about how the various candidates uh, that are being considered might work in context of the current group. Yeah, so this was not my favorite, like the Mm -hmm. end of this interlude. Um, I didn't like it very much. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I felt like everything was going really well. Like we're we're introducing these characters a little bit more because we've met some of these people, but haven't really gotten to see how they operate very much. So we're doing that in a very organic way by like showing them at work slash play. Um, Mm -hmm. And then it just feels like things kind of just stop. So Jack can do this long speechy exposition about how much he knows about each of these people, some of which is redundant information that we already know about. Um, some of it's new information, but I just feel like maybe there was a, a more interesting and organic way to give it to us. I mean, I will say that it does a good job of establishing like Jack and how he looks at things. But I don't know. I just felt like it, it's a very long speech. It's like the entire like almost like back forth of the chapter. Um, and I just, I, I didn't find it that engaging. Yeah. So you're referring to the part where he's just kind of like thinking about all the other. Nine right. Right. His right, whole, yeah. his whole carrot and stick where he goes down each member and does that. Um, yeah. I just think there, there, there maybe would be a more organic way to, to show this information to us. Yeah. I, th- I think you're probably right. I, I'm not going to say that I disliked it because I, I frankly thought it was fine. Although I, I think you're probably right that there, w- that there was a more uh integrated into the story way of of conveying this and i think ultimately like you say we know almost all of this information it's really just the fact that it's like we we didn't quite fully understand what jack got out of it and like why jack is in this group in the first place and that's that's one thing which i think is maybe not been directly addressed until now is like why is this a group why is there a nine why is there a slaughterhouse nine? Why isn't it just like, oh yeah, Jack Slash killed some more people this week, and in another city entirely, uh, Crawler was almost captured, and the, over here it's like, yeah, so there's a reason they're all together, and the reason is actually that Jack is is like amid them, not quite playing each other, playing them off each other, but but maintaining these delicate balances and enjoying doing it. And that yeah. is important to know, I think. Yeah, and, and I, I appreciate that aspect of it, sure. Um, I guess I guess the, the thing that bothered me most was, like, I feel like we had an entire uh, half of an arc talking about each of these people, and we got to know some of them more than others. We got to know a lot of them pretty well. Um, and then we kind of recycle a lot of that information here. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and I agree with you, it's, like, it's almost because we need to say, like, Jack knows all this stuff and Jack understands all this stuff. And that is important. Um, but some of it, I don't know, just kind of like felt a little inert to me. Yeah. But that's, I mean, enough. that's a very minor quibble. Like, I don't want to make it seem like I'm, <laughs> I'm like, like I, I still enjoyed the chapter. Yeah. Um, that was just a part of it. I didn't like as much. Yeah. It's just something that popped out to you. That's, that's fair enough. Yeah. And then our final chapter is the Jamie interlude. Um, young Jamie drives to a remote location in her car 
We don't know who this is. She isn't sure if she'll find anything when she gets to her destination or if she'll be kidnapped or if it's all a hoax. But eventually she arrives at a barn and at the appointed time, the inside of the barn turns into or becomes a portal into a different place, uh, some kind of like hospital-y, office-y place. And the doctor welcomes her to Cauldron. Uh, we see a bit of detail on how Cauldron found Jamie, basically by using honeypot websites, screening people who were looking for powers against the people who Cauldron would actually want to offer powers to, I guess. Yeah, um, I really like yeah. this as just a really like quick display of how resourceful this group is. Um, and that, like this and the whole chapter kind of shows that, like where it's like, this is Cauldron, this is how good they are. Mm-hmm. Be afraid. Or not yeah. afraid? I don't know. Yeah, so frankly, this is a very dense world-building chapter, so I'm hesitant to be the one who, who points out details um, so I don't draw your eye to them uh, uh, prematurely. Yeah, and, and the weird thing about this is I don't have too much to say about all this. I mean, I definitely have stuff to say, and as we go along, I'll point it out, but like, it serves as this fun little protracted mini-story um, that trickles out some interesting cauldron world-building information, like you said. Um, there's some thematic stuff I want to dive into a little bit here, but, um, if I have some less super interesting things to say as we go through this, that's kind of why it's just like, like a lot of times I'm just nodding my head and saying, huh, that's interesting and and pocketing it away. And I don't know what to do with it yet, um, but I'm, I'm noticing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, this is the, like, this is a giant package of information that we've been, you know, starving for, for for a long time now it's been it, it's been doled out to us in little little bits and now we're getting so much of it at the same time it's almost like you're just like okay all right yeah i used the uh, scanners uh, head exploding gif from- <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. that's about how i was feeling yeah so so it turns out that jamie is going to be tested uh, psychologically and physically and if she passes she'll be allowed to buy her power She's instructed to operate under strict secrecy on threat of death or similar level bad thing. Jamie wants powers because some guy named Madcap keeps breaking really bad capes out of jail before they get sent to the birdcage. And she feels this is just so wrong. And she also wants things to make sense again. Yeah, I will say that this little mini story is great because the character of Jamie, quote unquote, is uh, so well established. Um, we, we immediately understand who she is as a person. This is told out to us and we get it and we can follow that through her entire, uh, exchange through everything here. I really like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I want to ask, uh, I'll, never mind, I'll, I'll, I'll ask in just a second. Um, yeah. So the, um, the doctor shows her some binders with complicated lists and tabulations of probabilities for various outcomes for given samples. Variables include uniqueness, raw effect, and probability of a physical mutation. So it, it turns out it's going to be hard for Jamie to afford anything that would pose a challenge to Madcap. Yeah, I really love the attention to detail with this stuff. Like it's mm-hmm. like it, it makes you feel like it's part of this whole this much bigger thing um, that we didn't even know existed until now. That's really cool. Yeah, right. And just a little little bits are dropped, like this Nemesis program thing, which is basically just like fixing up heroes and villains for recreational combat. That's so crazy to me. I like, I like it. And it, I don't understand how it matches with whatever cauldron's goals are because I don't really understand what their goals are. Um, but even if they have goals that are nefarious, like how, like what this seems like just, Oh, let's do it. I don't know. It's very confusing. Yeah. Right. So the doctor eventually offers her a discount if she'll agree to provide three unspecified favors in the future. I think I said don't do it out loud. <laughs> this is <what's laughs> happening. Um, because like throughout this whole thing, we're seeing that like Jamie's fully aware of kind of that the doctor's doing double speak and she's yeah. saying things, but not not saying things. And like, but like we see how desperate she is that she's able to look past all that. And it. Uh, it, it, it's certainly painting Cauldron's intentions as kind of nefarious. Yeah. Um, nefarious, nefarious, whatever, um, that word. Um, and it just, it's troubling. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure, and, and this isn't a spoiler because I don't, I, it, it's just not, um, but but like, if if I were, if I were Cauldron, knowing nothing else about Cauldron than you know right now, I would, I would rather have three favors from a superhero than a favor from a superhero and some money. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly seems like the money part of it is not their main concern. I mm-hmm. mean, they have a, a building that can appear inside someone's apartment complex. So, like, I don't know how much, like, I don't think they're in business to make money. I don't think this is, this is representative of, like, corporate greed in the world of power humans. I think it's a pair of humans. I think it's something more than that. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, so then uh, this is where we start kind of skipping forward more quickly, which I, I like that device in this chapter, how we just skip through time and we're never really lost. Actually, it, it all makes sense. So we skip to presumably months later, she's gone through all the testing and is ready to receive her power. After signing the paper, she drinks her vial and she feels it burn painfully through her body. And to calm herself through this process, she tries to put herself into this meditative Tai Chi place where she's focusing on her body and focusing on tension and relaxation, tension and relaxation. And in the midst of this, she has a trigger vision, uh, which this time is more like flickering between several scenes. It's kind of different than the previous ones, I think. Yeah. So every time I see these things, I like read them intently, like sent six times um, to try to see if I can understand what's going on. And then I give up and I'm like, nope, I don't know. Um, yeah. I think we see like the line I picked out of here is, but then she was looking at different everyone and everything. So she sees like every single person on earth and then sees different everything person on there. So um, I'm thinking like multiple universes because we know, we know for a fact that there's at least two universes, right? Cause there's, they've mentioned earth bet like super casually yeah. <laughs> in that one line. So that's what I'm thinking that. And then the line at the end when she says, Tears ran down, ran down her cheeks. Not all were from pain. Some were sympathetic. I'm like, what? What is this, what is happening? Yeah, I, I think I interpret that as like some connection to whatever was in the vision. Right. But, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, after all this, she attempts to stand, and she accidentally demolishes a chair, and we see that she got some powers. We don't know, we don't know what they're what they are yet, though. I did. I do like how you. Uh, call attention to the tension and relaxation thing Mm -hmm. um, and how that maybe possibly ties into what her power ends up being. Um, Yeah. That's that's, very interesting. That's not something I noticed on my first read through. I'm, I'm fairly sure actually. Um, Yeah. So, so then we skip ahead again and she's almost immediately trying to take on Madcap, even though she hasn't like really tested out her power too much, apparently she gets trounced fairly embarrassingly, but he does protect her from the villains that he's freeing. And, Mm. uh, she goes back to the doctor and he tells her uh, she tells her uh, that if she joins the wards and gets on the path to becoming a protectorate member, then she'll get some help using her power. Yeah. A.K.A. Uh, we want you to join the wards because you'll be in a position to help us out more. Uh, but we want to make you think it was your idea because uh, we're called and we're super good at manipulating people. Yep. Just, just a little double speak there. Yep. Um, so we skip forward again and Madcap saying round eight puppy. Uh, and Jamie has been going after Madcap often, uh, this time with her team, which includes legend, or I guess is led by legend. So she outmaneuvers him and delays him long enough for legend to knock him out. And it's only at this point that he says, good job battery, which I frankly don't remember when I figured out that this was battery, but when do you think you, you figured it out in, in the progression of this? You know, I'd like to say that my insanely clever logic and prediction skills uh, guessed that this was Battery the second she got her powers, um, but that would be a lie. I had no idea until this moment. Okay. Yeah, that, I, that was probably the case for me, too, honestly, because um, I just wasn't thinking about Battery at this point in time. No. And, and also, you're not really sure where you are in time. Like, right, that, yeah. I, yeah. I, like I like, yeah. I like the beat where he calls her puppy. Um, cause I'm reading American gods right now and, oh. uh, that's what shadow, the main character's wife calls him. Um, oh, yeah. so there's this, I like that connection there. It's a very weird pet name for someone. Um, it, it means a lot in that, in that story. I don't know how much it means here. Um, but it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah. So madcap, um, argues now that he's been caught, uh, to be allowed to join the good guys since he's never killed anybody and legend hears him out because legend has actually established a track record at this point of being open to villains joining the good guys if they're not too bad and uh but but madcap insists that he be be allowed to join battery's team and renames himself assault 
which is <laughs> just the best thing. It is so good. I love the battery loses her shit about it too. Um, yeah. because she realizes it will cause her name to take on a different meaning right. because that's absolutely what happened to me. Like, bes- yeah. like I knew that her power was charging up and releasing it. Uh-huh. And for some reason, it never occurred to me that that was like a battery. It yeah. was just, it went with assault and battery. So I love that, like, she's fully aware this is going to happen. And it absolutely did on me. Did it on you? Did you get the battery thing before this moment? Um, I think I may have, I, I'm not sure, honestly. Like, like I, I think I assumed from their first introduction that they were like a combo team who had named themselves assault and battery. Yeah. And then I might, I might have grasped the idea that she was a battery battery. Like when, when you see the concept of like she charges up and her suit becomes glowing white and stuff, but I am not going to say that I did necessarily, but I, I mean, regardless of whether you get it in, in advance, it, it's just delightful here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we skip, um, we skip forward again and assault is, uh, badgering battery for a date and she tells him that she'll give him a date if he goes to a terrible boring charity kids thing with her and he accepts and then of course he turns out to be great with kids yeah i love this moment a lot and i i, I want to wait till we're done with the interlude before we talk about their relationship and what this is about the world and then the changing nature of, of right and wrong and all that but uh i liked the moment a lot yeah and uh, at this point, Cauldron calls in their first favor. They want a package to be delivered. Um, and I wonder what that package is. I'm yeah. sure it won't be significant at all. Yeah. Uh, later, it's clear that, uh, or at least I, be- <laughs> I think it's clear, that uh, Assault and Battery are living together. Uh, yeah, that's and what this I guess. I assume they just- were married, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. That, that felt right, yeah. Um, and this is just after the Shatterbird attack, so we're back to the present time. And another letter has arrived, which says Siberian and Shatterbird are to escape the city and our business with you will be done. Thank you, Cauldron. So we know that there are two Cauldron capes on uh, the Slaughterhouse Nine now. Um, I don't that's I don't know what exactly that exactly that says. Um, it it may, may, makes me seem like Cauldron is not necessarily a good organization. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily bad either. I think it's really thematically interesting for like Cauldron to represent this this theme that we keep hitting over and over again about this like you have this lofty idealistic goal but really questionable practices and I think maybe they fit in there too much I'm not sure um how having two members on the nine helps whatever their goals are um but I'm assuming we'll we'll deal with that uh, at a yeah. later date. Yeah, I thought that was a beautifully like like you, you're given like these ominous kind of foreboding undertones from the doctor and all the stuff that's going on. And, and it's like, I don't know, battery, what have you gotten yourself into? This right. could be, this could be kind of bad. And then, and then it ends with like, oh yeah, these two horrible people, they, they're with us. Don't, yeah. don't bother. Yeah, they work. It's like, oh dear. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, it's certainly like, I, I just, I think this, this story has got me in a place where like, I'm not, I'm scared of prematurely judging anything but like uh-huh. my initial reaction was uh, cauldron's bad news and then i had to think about it for a while and thought well maybe they're not maybe they're trying to say like i don't know that's what that's what the story's done to me no that's i think that's wonderful all right so we want to talk about assault and battery real quick and then sure, we'll yeah. wrap this thing up so yeah. i love all of this um mm-hmm. i love how much this ties into everything we've been talking about like i love that like she's so desperate to want to make a difference and stop bad things from happening that she like joins forces with this organization. She doesn't fully know anything about it's, it's like full in ends justify the means. It's like, I want this. I need this. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. Um, so she does that. She's a good person. She joins the ward. She joins the protectorate. She's a good guy. She takes down the guy she did all this for. And then boom, we got moral grayness. Um, like he's a mercenary he does bad things but he's not necessarily a bad guy um he wants to become a good guy to avoid prison he does it and then suddenly (laughs) suddenly he's good with kids and like they're getting along and he's becoming a really good hero and it's like it's like throwing that grayness that we were talking about back in your face like right and wrong up and down like what where is all this stuff how how nebulous and shifting and changing this can be um it's so good 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this this uh, is almost a microcosm for a lot of the stuff that we're seeing in, in the story, actually. Yeah, and I think the most important part about that is if this is a little mini story um, reflecting on the larger story and Taylor's larger journey, then what what we see is, one, I think we see that Taylor and Battery are kind of like really alike um, in a lot of ways. And I suspect that that'll be used for interesting drama. I think they're going to come in contact with each other again. We've already seen that first initial one. Um, but the thing I also see is that like Taylor has not crossed that point of no return, right? And we see in Madcap slash Assault, we see that there is a a path for her to goodness, um, especially if she keeps like being Taylor Hero um, and like rebranding and reforming. Like Skitter can become something more, and we kind of see that path. And I don't know if that'll eventually end up being good or bad for her but i think it's very interesting to see that through their interaction um i really like that a lot Mm -hmm. and then lastly this whole thing like made me convinced that battery will not go through with the final act of cauldron um i don't think she's going to do it we can call that my speculation um she's not going to do it um and i think we're going to see what happens when you disobey cauldron and uh i don't know what that means (laughs) all right well, that's the, the, some of those sounded suspicious, just suspiciously like speculation, Scott. So why don't we segue into Wonderful. your official speculations for this uh, point All in time? Right. Wonderful segue. Um, I forgot to uh, update my ones from previously. I don't think we got anything confirmed this week, actually. I don't think anything I don't, that I had said yeah. was confirmed. So, okay. I think you're right. Okay, so I wasn't just lazy. I was just, I was just yeah. good. Awesome. Right. Um, so my first speculation is I think Taylor is going to eventually kill someone. I think she's going to cross that line eventually. Uh, I wish I wasn't speculating this, but I think it's going to happen. Um, my guess is it will probably be a member of the nine. I think they're going to force her into a situation um, that, that she feels like she has to. And then, and this might be a separate one, but I think she's going to kill Coil. I really do. Um, I think she's going to do everything that Coil asked of her. Um, She's going to ask for Dinah back, and she's not going to get it, and that's going to be her a line for her. So I think okay. that's going to happen. And then my second one is what we already talked about, that Battery will not carry out Cauldron's third task. Um, and it's going to be bad. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen to her. It's going to be bad. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful as always. Um, yeah. So, Scott, that wraps up Arc 12, Plague. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback and we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. Yeah, you can reach us via email uh, at gotwormpod at gmail.com. Actually, right before we started recording, I saw we got an email, so I haven't had a chance to respond to that one yet, but we like getting emails. I like these. I try to respond to every single one, um, so keep sending them. Uh, You can talk to us on Twitter at gotwormpod. I do my live tweets of the each arc uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do one for Arc 13, Matt. We're so late in the week. I don't know if yeah. it's going to happen. Um, it will definitely happen for the ones going going forward. But uh, follow me there. Uh, I, it's a lot of fun doing that. I, I love yeah, <laughs> doing my reactions and then seeing you guys' reactions to my reactions. It's really great. Um, my personal Twitter is at ScottDale85, and Matt's is at Um That's going to be in the show notes, so you can follow it there because I can't spell it, and I don't think Matt can either. No, no one can. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strong, strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Overcast, and pretty much anywhere else in the world that you can listen to podcasts. And you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. That's D-A-L-Y. Uh, we put out a podcast this week where Matt and I sat down to talk Wonder Woman with friend of the pod, Michael Grubb. Um, we had some pretty differing opinions on that film, Matt. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think I think I think the thing was, you walked out saying you wanted your money back. Um, it's not exactly what I said. <laughs> it's a really good discussion, though. If you haven't checked that out, uh, we suggest you do. It's a lot of fun. Um, there are spoilers in there, but we delineate the spoiler section from the not. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, you can still listen to the first part of our discussion. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so uh, we also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms. That's D-A-L-Y. If you like what we do here and want to help make sure we keep doing more, consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. A very special thanks to our new producer, Marcus J. Uh, thank you so much for honoring us by donating to what we do. We are a mere $34 away from our next goal, which is uh, the return of the Daily Planet Book Club, Book Club uh, a monthly series where uh, Scott and I dive into a book of your choice and analyze and discuss it live. Um, if you like what we're doing with Worm, we think you'll really love those discussions as well. We've done a couple in the past with other books, and, and those are really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe one, actually. It was two. Anyway. It was two. Two, yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, also, while you're over at Patreon, uh, please make sure you stop by Wildbo's page and toss some money there because he's the guy that makes this whole thing possible. And as always, if you're one of those people that can't spare any extra cash, of course we understand that. Um, there are still tons of ways you can help us out. Share this podcast with friends, family, enemies. Um, <laughs> if you're listening on iTunes, uh, you can rate and review us. Uh, today's review... Uh, is from Wellwick in the UK because I find I found out how to check reviews from other countries, Matt. I didn't know I could awesome. do that. Um, so I we found I, some new ones. I didn't know that we couldn't see ones from other countries. Neither did but, I, but we couldn't. Yeah. Um, uh, this review is titled "Insightful and Copacetic." Uh, Wellwick says, "Following Scott and Matt as they read through Worm is fascinating as they deconstruct the characters, themes, fights, and twists. Great for both new and old readers. They catch details you may have easily missed in your first tense, hurried read through. And Scott makes some clever predictions based on." well-spotted foreshadowing if you haven't read worm yet i can't recommend this enough and as a reading companion these guys are in it till the end and it's going to be an amazing ride matt i I really think it's just like a new form of therapy for me to sit down and read these (laughs) reviews every week um like you guys are so nice you're so wonderful like i can't stress enough how much it means to us to hear this kind of positive support and feedback from you guys like thank you guys so much this is incredible it's incredible yeah it really really makes our our week uh, yeah, so next week we jump into Arc 13, Snare. Scott, what is your interpretation of the title of that arc? I think the battle between the Slaughterhouse Nine and the heroes and villains of Brockton Bay will continue to escalate. That's my best announcer voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and someone will be caught in some sort of trap or snare. Um, my hope is it's the Undersider setting a trap for the horrible Slaughterhouse Nine monsters. Uh, but my guess is it will be the opposite way around unfortunately but we'll find out that's right so tune in next wednesday and every wednesday for another exciting episode of we've got worm bye-bye <laughs>